Good morning, everybody. I see people hopping on. Just give ourselves a few more minutes till 930 here. I'm just, I'm wondering if my echo shows up on the rest of this guy. All righty, hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Fracking and Zoning in Your Community. We're going to get started right now. I'm Robin Martin with Food and Water Watch and um, just giving people last minute chance to hop on. If you're at your computer, we highly recommend clicking the link to join the video like I see that you all are. You're going to be able to see us through the program we're using called Zoom. Um, seems like everybody now is being really adept at Zoom. We will email the recording around to everyone who signed up in the beginning. So don't worry if you can't hop on the video or need to leave at any point. The recording will also be available later on uh, via YouTube. So I can see everybody hopping on. So welcome everybody. Thank you again for being with us today. Before we get started, I'll just give you a quick orientation. Um, just to let you know, even though we're here on video, you'll be able to see all the speakers as they share. If you click the link you received in your email, but don't worry, we can't see you. Um, we're gonna be keeping everybody on mute to cut down on the background noise. If you have a question, at any point, you can click the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to many of those questions as we can throughout and at the end of the webinar. Um, we will not be using the chat feature. I see some people chatting, but we won't be using it. Um, we are going to start with the questions that you wrote when you RSVP'd, so bear with us as we try to answer the most asked questions first. I'll also note that we will not be using the raised hand button feature at the bottom of the screen. So once again, just make sure that you click Q&A if you want to ask a question. If you have any technical issues or if you're joining us over the phone and have any questions, just give us an email at help at fwaction.org and we have folks standing by to help. So let's get started. Fracking can occur in any community regardless of size or area. Many municipalities feel that there is not much that they can do to protect their communities. But in fact, there are many options that can be individually tailored to fit the needs of their community. Today, we're going to hear from expert organizers, land use planners, and municipal officials who will share their experiences with oil and gas ordinances in their community. But first, let me introduce our Pennsylvania director, Megan McDonough, who will be giving us a little bit of background on Food and Water Watch and Food and Water Action, as well as introducing our colleague, Doug Shields. Alrighty, thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Megan McDonough, and I am the Pennsylvania Director here at Food and Water Watch, Food and Water Action, and I manage all of our work throughout the state of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here bright and early and for choosing to spend your Saturday morning with us. Uh, there's a lot of information to get to this morning, so I will keep my remarks brief. Uh, here at Food and Water Watch, we are a national organization that has been hard at work over the last 15 years to create a healthy future for all people in generations to come. A world where everyone has food they can trust, clean drinking water, and a livable climate. Making this happen requires involving people in many of the pressing issues of our time at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, building, on, building on one at, win after another, uh, as we develop a larger movement that has the political power to make our dem democratic process work for everyone. In southwestern Pennsylvania, we have expanded our team through our municipal ordinance project. This is a project that is unique for our organization, but very much necessary here in southwestern Pennsylvania. We are proud to be joined this morning and again on Monday evening by an all-star lineup of experts in their fields, to bring you a comprehensive look at how you can make sure your community is adequately providing for the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. I am proud to introduce you to our Southwestern Pennsylvania team members, Doug Shields, who is our Western Pennsylvania Outreach Liaison, and our Allegheny County Organizer, who you just heard from, Robin Martin. They will be moderating this morning's webinar, and with that being said, I will turn this over to Doug Shields to talk more about the Municipal Ordinance Project and what it does. Doug? Thank you, Megan, and welcome, everybody. I just <laughs> I just dropped my notes. Excuse me. Uh, getting started off on the right foot. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank all of you for attending this morning. And before we get started, I'd like to show you a few slides. Uh, the first one is not that one, but we're going to get the slideshow up here. And uh, one, two, and this is it. This is one of my favorite pictures. I came across this with Frack Tracker. This is Versailles, Pennsylvania, back in 1920. And this is what happens to the neighborhood when the municipality doesn't have a good zoning code or a comprehensive plan. As you can see, industrial and residential land uses mixed together aren't what one might call an ideal compatible land use. Uh, having uh, oil wells coming out of the living room isn't necessarily what people want today. Generally, they want a big screen TV and cable. Uh, but the, that's what it was. And, but today we have a more enlightened approach with modern zoning codes to prevent incompatible land uses, to protect property, and to protect the public's health. That's the primary function of uh, the uh, Municipal Planning Code and planning generally. Or do we have that now? Let's take a look. The next slide. Uh, things look a little bit the same as uh, Versailles there. This is a, uh, this is a uh, subdivision in uh, <clears throat> Mansfield, Texas, and not quite 1920s Versailles, but there it is. And you see industrial uses being mixed in with residential uh, uses. And again, we see another slide here, uh, Colorado subdivision and in PA. But in PA, uh, we, at the local level, we have the ability to determine where unconventional drilling and associated land uses go. It is the locals, by law, who have the inherent right to define the character of the community as the Supreme Court said in Pennsylvania, and that's done through local zoning. And today we're gonna to be uh, uh, talking about that with our first panelists, uh, about the basics of planning, zoning, and land use, something unfamiliar to us all, but incredibly important. And also Allegheny County is home to 1.2 million people, 130 municipalities, and the <clears throat> county sits like an island in a sea of gas wells, as you can see here on this map from Frack Tracker Alliance. Um, the, uh, as you can see, uh, oil and gas wells are slowly encroaching upon the county's more densely populated communities. This recently updated frack tracker map, in fact, it was just updated a week ago, illustrates this land use. The purple dots are wells, the yellow dots are violations, which are sitting on top of most of those wells, and the green dots uh, represent compressor stations. And, and while regulations are in place, that's for sure, uh, they seem to have a hard time with complying with those regulations based on all those yellow dots. And arguably, uh, certainly I would argue that the regulations certainly don't uh, take into account a lot of things that we need to be concerned about. So what does the, our response to 
to this was the municipal ordinance project was developed to help Allegheny County's residents and municipal governments to prepare for unconventional shale gas extraction, commonly known as fracking. In 2016-2017, Food and Water Watch reviewed 105 Allegheny County municipal codes. The results were shocking. More than 20 years after the first unconventional well was drilled in Southwest Pennsylvania, over 50 municipalities in Allegheny County had no zoning ordinances on the books to, cut, to govern where fracking takes place. Now, mind you, everything else is governed where it takes place. The local McDonald's, the bank, the hair salon, your home, the park, that's all done through zoning, planning, and land use at the local level. And to not have anything on the books is uh, basically an uh, abdication, you know, leaving the municipality wide open for all kinds of problems. Other municipal codes we found uh, were woefully inadequate or outdated or even non-compliant with current state law. For instance, setbacks in some or, uh, municipalities are 200 feet. The state minimum is 500 feet. So what happens is for us, the municipal ordinance project is basically we identify these communities, we engage with local governments, and we organize local citizens to become effective advocates. Uh, zoning is not something that everybody gets up and worries about, uh, but it does become an important issue when you have land uses, particularly like unconventional drilling, coming into your community. They're very impactful. So that's why we're at work here in the vineyard, if you will. Um, next slide. And then things to look for. When you're a citizen or a council member or a planning commission member, you should be taking some self-assessments here about what's in your community. Do you have industrial zones that might be capable of hosting an industrial activity like unconventional drilling or associated uses? Do you require a conditional use exception? Uh, and is that conditional use available to use in all zoning districts? For instance, Monroeville had a zoning ordinance that allowed drilling in all zoning districts by way of conditional use. When that was pointed out to the council, they quickly acted and restricted it to its industrial zone. Are the appropriate setbacks for a well site determined? As we know, setbacks are there for one reason and one reason only. It's for public safety and, and the health and welfare. Given the history of unconventional drilling and the hazards that it poses, we have determined that 500 feet as the state minimum is certainly inadequate to protect us, our health, welfare, and safety from explosions, exposures to toxics, and so forth. And we'll discuss this throughout this webinar uh, today and on Monday evening. Do you have a seismic survey ordinance? That's when the thumper trucks come and do uh, seismic testing in your community. They have been known to cause property damage. They also need to get the permission of the owner. Otherwise, they can be held liable for seismic trespass. And the municipality needs to govern the public use of the public right of way. Uh, if you don't have it, you should have one. Is there an injection well ordinance? And one of our local officials that will be on the following panel today will talk about that in Plum Borough and what happened there. Um, use default table uh, are, uh, for unlisted uses, and this goes directly to the injection well problem in Plum. If it's not listed, then it is a uh, uh, conditional use exception in the whole of the borough. Uh, and, they lo and Plum Borough lost on a substantive validity challenge. We'll get into that with the lawyers on Monday. Public lands may be leased there. Uh, do you have public lands that are leased or potentially leased? And can your municipality prohibit the leasing of public lands? Um, uh, uh, Emsworth Borough did exactly that back in 2012. Um, and what's in the conditional use? The devil's in the details. Um, to give you an example, uh, South Fayette Township's conditional use exception for oil and gas is about 23 pages long. So we wanna make sure that uh, that we are covering ourselves for these uses. You can't kind of let this go and say, well, I hope everything works out. And we'll move on to our next slide here. Oh, sorry, try reloading, okay. So what we're doing now is we're, Food and Water Watch is working into the South Hills. And uh, this slide's kind of weird because it doesn't have all the things that are on it. <laughs> it's, it's a cosmic problem. But, you know, places like Bridgeville, Bethel Park, Collier Township, North Fayette, Scott Township, Mount Lebanon, McKeesport, um, those are the places that we have not yet been. We've been in the north and the east and the central part of the county, but we'd like to open up an effort in the South Hills and work with communities there to shape up their codes and put appropriate zoning ordinances 
on the books. And by the way, when I talk about these things, we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about legal, enforceable ordinances that have been tested uh, in the courts and so forth. So we're not looking to get the borough sued by anybody. Um, and then if you, we move along, we also did a report card uh, we, in, in our review. These are just some selected ones, but as you note, uh, you know, uh, we, we're trying to do a matrix here about do they have setbacks established and you see the red X's all over the place. Uh, the 10-year master plan, expiration provisions of their conditional use exceptions. Nobody has these, but these are things that are commonly found in zoning codes uh, forever. Uh, and these deficiencies need and faults need to be cured. Let's take a quick look at Bethel Park, for instance. Do they have a conditional use exception? And unfortunately, this slide's coming up blank. I don't know why. You know what? I'm going to escape. Uh -oh. Let me see if I can. Right, we're going to see if we can. Yeah. It like this. It's not fancy, but yeah. There we go. We'll do we're, that. We're practical. Okay. I don't know why that happens. It's the uh, mysteries of the, uh, the uh, internet. So, in Bethel Park, for instance, do they have a conditional use exception? Yes, they do. However, the conditional use allows for uh, uh, unconventional drilling throughout the whole of the borough. Uh, if you think that's appropriate to go back to a Versailles 1920 model and allow for industrial uses in your residential areas, uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the Middlesex Township case said that's okay as long as it's done by the local officials. And in that case, 95% uh, was deliberately opened up for oil and gas. That was a pretty serious case that is still uh, I'm not sure if it's finally litigated, but it's not in good, sh uh, good shape. Uh, and do you have an industrial zone? No, Bethel Park does. So then the question comes to the state is, well, how are municipalities without industrial zones expected to host industrial uses? Um, is there a safe setbacks? It reverts back. There is none established. So that means the state minimum of 500 feet comes into play. And we know that uh, various medical health studies and what have recommended anything from a minimum of 2,000 feet to up to a mile away from a well so that people are not subjected to toxic fumes. Uh, do they have a 10-year master plan requirement in their conditional use? Uh, telling the, uh, the uh, uh, drilling concern, you know, okay, you're going to put a pad in, what else is going to come? Uh, compressor stations, cryogenics, uh, all the midstream activity that comes along. That has to be accounted for as the land use. Um, do you have an expiration provision in your code on conditional use? For instance, at the Edgar Thompson work, uh, Marion Oil and Gas didn't do much at all to commence its use that it was granted by East Pittsburgh PA, and that expired. Now they're fighting that in court. Uh, but these things are kind of keep for an orderly progression. Everybody, everybody involved knows what's going on. When you leave these holes in your code, then you all end up in court. That's something you want to avoid. In fact, ending up in court is a signal that something's wrong with your ordinances. If you have good laws, you don't go to court. Uh, so, and where's your injection well ordinance in Bethel Park? Well, they don't have one. Uh, do you have a seismic survey ordinance in Bethel Park? Well, that, it happens, but you don't account for it. Other people that use the public right away, if I put a dumpster, I have to get a permit. Uh, if I do seismic survey, a commercial activity, I just come into town and that's it. So those are the kinds of things that we want to get into here um, and working with this. And, and just to throw up real quickly, let's just scroll right down to the uh, model ordinance. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time here, but just to give you the Oakmont slide, uh, let's go to the next slide. I think I added it in. Just all right. This is an example of what Oakmont had prior to 2019. We worked with Oakmont. We worked with the citizens, the council, the planning commission. And we ended up with a great ordinance for that community, and they're very happy about it. This is what they had before. It, this is the whole conditional use exception. And as I said, South Fayette Township is 23 pages. So you have line, line, words like reflect landscaping adequately so as to screen and buffering neighboring properties. That's very difficult to discern what's adequate. That's very subjective. And when you go to a court of law, the court's going to go, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, are we located a sufficient distance from inhabited structures? I don't know what that is either. Um, and, and no event shall be located within 200 feet of any inhabited structure. 200 feet, and of course, the minimum is five, and that's not even safe. But also what was most, the one that caught the council's attention there was gas and oil production in residential districts is limited exclusively to the park. 
in the district, which makes absolutely no sense at all. So, you know, I said, well, where are the kids going to play uh, in the park out in the street and get hit by a water truck coming to the side? So let's move on to our next and all final slide on this one. What can you do? This is what this is really all about, whether you're a local official or a citizen. One, get involved with your local government. Meet with your council members. Ask, for, ask questions. Um, and you are going to give you enough information here where you can start doing that uh, after this uh, webinar. Determine if your town is ready to able host an uh, oil and gas extraction. And then organize, organize, organize. Host a community meeting. We'll be happy to come out and help you and your fellow citizens better understand what's going on in your community and where we can make things better. And don't know how to organize? We're here to help. And if you need more information, call Robin Martin or contact her at this email or myself, and we'll be happy to sit down with you and uh, set up some meetings with your local members and evaluate your code and move thoughtfully uh, through the process to end up in a better place and be responsible for what we're supposed to be doing with our municipal planning, zoning, and land use. So that concludes our remarks on that. And now we're going to get into all of that wonderful stuff with uh, two of our great guests and uh, Megan, you're going to introduce them for us. All right, I say Megan, I'm sorry, Robin, right? Okay. We're running over time already. I knew I would. <laughs> All righty, thank you so much, Doug. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our next panelists, uh, Denny Puko and Nick Makareth. Denny Puko is the principal of Denny Puko Planning Consultant and works with communities in the area of planning, zoning, and land use. From 2004 to 2019, he was with the PA Department of Community and Economic Development, providing technical assistance to Pennsylvania municipal governments in the areas of comprehensive planning, strategic planning, land use ordinances, and training. Mr. Puko has developed and written extensively about land use review processes and the duties of planning commissions, zoning hearing boards, and zoning officers. And he also created implementable comprehensive plan approach that's been utilized throughout the state. All righty. And then next up, we have Nicholas Makareth. He is the local government planning policy specialist at the PA Department of Community and Economic Development. Mr. Makareth serves as a resource for local government officials, developers, and citizens interested in planning to improve, grow, and enhance communities. DCD's Mr. Makareth provides local governments with valuable tools that will support wise land use decisions, encourages economic development, and a healthy environment and strong communities. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to have Denny and Nick on board with us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about zoning basics. Uh, Nick and I are going to talk about zoning basics. Um, like any activity, it's important to know the fundamentals. If you want to do the bigger, larger things that Doug talked about in terms of regulating uh, natural gas and oil activity, it's again important to have the fundamentals down and to understand and know those quite well. So that's going to be the focus of what Nick and I talk about, the fundamentals of zoning, the zoning basics, and try to make sure that you all have as well-rounded a foundation to, to go forward on. Uh, I believe there's going to be a panel um, on Monday that's going to have experts talking more about the, 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 the legal aspects of oil and gas with relation to zoning, talking about some court cases and some of the outcomes of those court cases. And Nick and I are not going to focus as much on that. Um, honestly, we're planners. We'll leave that to the attorneys tomorrow to talk more about that stuff, but we hope to provide you with a good bit of the basics. Oh, wait. Okay. A uh, really quick roundup of zoning. Here you see a picture of where it is and where it isn't in Pennsylvania. About two thirds of Pennsylvania municipalities are covered with zoning, but about 92% of the population. Uh, zoning, you can see the darker municipalities that don't have zoning ordinances are mostly in rural parts of Pennsylvania. One of the things that I think is more shocking to us from a zoning standpoint, and I guess a quick uh, note that these are, these are 2015 data. Uh, the, the DCED is in the process of updating this data, but we have 2015 data here. 
but two thirds of the zoning ordinances in the state are older, 10 years old or older. That is a significant statewide problem. Uh, we've got ordinances with band-aids and patches. They've got conflicting provisions. They have provisions that aren't cross-referenced. Uh, boy, if I say one thing to municipalities out there, uh, make it a priority to update and modernize your outdated zoning ordinance. Also, those outdated zoning ordinances are a missed opportunity. There are newer, better, more sensible zoning provisions that uh, planners and municipalities have, have learned and put in place more recently, and you want to take advantage of those better practices. Here's the basics. Zoning is an ordinance that a municipality may use to regulate use of land, location, intensity, and character of development. The important thing here is that it's a, an ordinance that a municipality may use. There's no mandate in Pennsylvania that municipalities have zoning. It is a choice. The municipality can choose to enact an ordinance to improve the welfare of, of its citizens, or it can choose not to. The other thing about zoning in Pennsylvania is it is enacted by, administered by, and for the good of that local municipality. There is state legislation, which we'll talk about in a moment, the Municipalities Planning Code that provides the authority for zoning, but that authority is fairly broad. And a municipality has a lot of leeway in deciding how best to regulate itself from a zoning standpoint. Regulations can be designed uniquely for each municipality. Each municipality is different. That's been accepted and acknowledged by the courts. And the courts have generally given a lot of leeway to municipalities to self-determine their, their objectives, the character of their community, and the appropriate zoning regulations to apply. And I guess the other note I want to make about this is that zoning, as Doug said earlier, has real clout. Um, I have run across municipal officials that remain surprised. Oh, you mean we can say what is done or not done or how a piece of property is used or developed? Yes, you can. That's, that's zoning's purpose. It's a legitimate purpose. And uh, it's, a, it's something that has real clout. Okay, zoning has two parts. It has a map. I think most of you are familiar with this. And it has text. Text gets into uh, the different zoning districts and what the permitted uses are in those different zoning districts. And here you just have an example of a typical zoning map and typical zoning ordinance text. As I said earlier, um, Pennsylvania provides the authority, the Pennsylvania General Assembly, our legislature provided authority to local governments to do planning and zoning through a law called the Pennsylvania Municipalities Planning Code. That's where municipalities derive their authority. And as you are doing zoning, you want to be familiar with the planning code. We'll go over that there are things that it permits municipalities to regulate and purposes that municipalities may regulate for, and those things are important. Also, from a legal standpoint, important is Dillon's rule. Pennsylvania is a Dillon's Rule state, and basically Dillon's Rule says that local governments are limited to the powers granted to them by the Commonwealth, by the Pennsylvania legislature. So it's never a question of uh, the municipality's planning code doesn't prohibit me from regulating this so I can regulate it. It's exactly the opposite. Unless you have the authority to put regulations in place for a particular activity or purpose, then it's something you may not do as a municipality. And again, Dillon's rule talks about that being an, an express authority or a reasonably implied authority or an indispensable kinds of power. But basically, again, municipalities have the ability to use the zoning powers that have been granted to them by the Commonwealth. Uh, courts and case law are also important. Um, an example is that, um, in the area of subdivision and land development, you may be familiar that the PA courts have ruled that billboards and uh, cell towers do not fit the definition of land development and therefore cannot be regulated as land developments. 
it's an instance where for for me i disagree that they've changed the uh the the um the definition but courts do that so uh, municipalities and their solicitors need to be knowledgeable about case law and what the courts have said additionally about municipal authority and regulations and there's also preemptions uh, in the case of what we're talking about now uh, the pennsylvania oil and gas act does have preemptions in other words there are certain things that in this state law in the oil and gas act uh, the legislature has said that even though we've given municipalities the ability to regulate lots of things through zoning we're now saying in the oil and gas act that there are certain things that municipalities may not regulate uh, the oil and gas act says that local ordinance local ordinances shall not impose conditions requirements or limitations on features of oil and gas well operations regulated by the act so again there are preemptions that you need to be wary about as well zoning as i mentioned earlier uh, the municipalities planning code provides some broad purposes and 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 areas that you may regulate and these are those this is important Again, as you're looking <clears throat> in your zoning ordinance, what you may regulate and for what purpose, here's the list of them. I'm not gonna read them. I think they're probably fairly uh, commonly known. But again, these are the areas in which the legislature has granted authority. Uh, for instance, on the zoning purpose side, one of the things that the legislature has not granted authority as a purpose of zoning is aesthetics. On the regulation side, uh, zoning may, can regulate a lot of things in, in terms of the use of land, but the legislature did not provide uh, authority to local governments to regulate the tenure or the income of occupants. Uh, you can't say a certain zoning district only ha is for higher or lower income occupants, or, or you may not allow renters in a certain zoning district. So again, these are the areas that the, the planning code has provided the authority and applying Dillon's rule, then you would say that these are, these are the limits of the authority of local governments in which they may regulate things under zoning. There are some prescriptive aspects of zoning. For the most part, as I said, zoning is broad. Uh, the authority is fairly broad and the courts have backed municipalities in that broad authority. But the legislature has been prescriptive in a couple of areas, and these are those. Uh, zoning may not unreasonably restrict forestry or the display of religious symbols. Zoning shall support ag land and ag development, shall protect natural and historic resources, which is important for the topic we're talking about today. It is a shall, it is not a may, it is not a power a municipality may exercise. If a municipality is going to employ a zoning ordinance, it shall protect the natural and historic features of that municipality. But at the same time, the legislature said the zoning ordinance shall allow reasonable development of minerals. And then up in the upper right hand corner on this slide, you see a couple of the larger areas of preemptions um, the legislature has said that in the area of farming, normal farming operations and the right to farm, uh, we're protecting that from overzealous zoning regulation. And there's preemptions we already talked about in oil and gas and other kinds of minerals. Here's an important part of zoning. Zoning regulations must serve a public purpose. And that public purpose must be expressed in a statement of community development objectives. Zoning regulations cannot be arbitrary. Again, they're to serve a public purpose. The statement of community development objectives, according to the planning code, can be provided by either the municipal comprehensive plan or a statement of legislative findings. Um, it is not required that zoning be based on a comprehensive plan. That's the best route for obvious reasons. In a comprehensive plan, you're looking comprehensively and completely at um, all of the characteristics of the community. 
you're involving the public and citizens in a process of planning for the future. And you are, again, putting together a thorough and complete plan about all aspects of your community. So that's really the best route to go to determine those public purposes and determine those community development objectives on which your zoning ordinance will be based. But there are zoning ordinances that are not based on a comprehensive plan and simply have a statement of legislative findings, which is often a preamble to the ordinance or some, sometimes it's a, um, a uh, preamble uh, for like each district or each section of the ordinance. This matters. The statement of community development objectives is important. It's important for natural gas regulations. There are gonna be questions about which districts you believe um, oil and gas activities are appropriate. On what basis did you make that decision? You looked at the character of your community, the nature of development, the economic and environmental interests, and on that basis, you've determined the districts that, that oil and gas activities are most appropriate in. Also, this is gonna be the debate, the basis, and we'll talk a little bit more about criteria and standards for conditional uses and special exceptions, but these community development objectives are gonna be the basis for that, and, in, and if you're challenged in court, a court's gonna turn to this basis of community development objectives to learn if you have a legal rationale for the regulations you put in place. Okay, a couple quick more zoning basics. Uh, zoning districts, again, zoning ordinances create zoning districts. There's a couple of different formats that the traditional segregated what we call Euclidean, not because it's got anything to do with geometry, but it's based on the town, a town in Ohio, Euclid, Ohio, and a court case. This is kind of the old school zoning, R1, R2, B1, B2, residential use is only allowed in residential, business only in business, et cetera, et cetera. Zoning ordinances has have progressed and have become, I think, more enlightened, more current creative approaches, which are better for the community to promote more mixed use, because that's really how communities work, how they've long worked, that uses are more in intermingled with each other. And you see uh, creative zoning districts like town center, village zones, traditional neighborhoods. And there's another uh, form of zoning district format that is taking um, more interest in Pennsylvania lately called form-based, in which the zones are not based on uses and segregation of uses, but the zoning districts are based on the form, pattern, and intensity of development. And you see zones like the rural zone, the suburban zone, and the urban center zone. And again, if your zoning ordinance is out of date and you're looking to modernize your ordinance and you bring a consultant on board, talk to that consultant about these new, better, improved approaches to looking at zoning and zoning districts. All right, another important basic, three types of permitted uses in a zoning ordinance. And you see typically a zoning ordinance permitted use list. It'll have what it calls permitted uses. It may just say permitted uses, but what, are, what it really means is permitted uses by right. And those last two words are important, even though they're not always visible in the zoning ordinance. By right means that determination is made by the zoning officer only. And if the use meets the, the requirements in terms of the zoning ordinance, then the zoning officer shall permit it. And there's no, not even any public notice or any additional public involvement, public hearing or whatever. Permitted uses by right. Zoning ordinances may also have permitted uses by conditional use. A conditional use is a uh, decision made by the governing body. And in this instance, there is public notice and a hearing to determine whether or not the, uh, the application meets the uh, conditional use requirements. There's also ordinances may permit uses by special exceptions. This is exactly the same as a conditional use, except that the decision is made by the zoning hearing board. Also after public notice and after a hearing. Why the terms are so different, conditional use and special exception, I can't explain. It's just the way things were created. 
But again, conditional uses and special exceptions are essentially the same thing, except that in one case, the decisions made by the governing body, whether to grant or deny the application, and the other the decision is made by the zoning hearing board. Let's talk a little bit more about those. Why do you include conditional uses and special exceptions in a zoning ordinance? Mainly because there are some uses out there, oil and gas uses are an example, that likely need additional controls and consideration. And with both a conditional use and a special exception, an ordinance must contain express standards and criteria. In other words, if you're gonna say that a, a compressor station or a gas well is only allowed as a conditional use, then there must be express standards and criteria that uh, define objective and measurable kinds of standards that 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 use has to meet. Again, with a conditional use and a special exception, a hearing must be held, a hearing which takes evidence and testimony, and um, there's the ability on the part of the deciding body to attach reasonable conditions. Uh, a couple additional notes. In an, in an application for conditional use or a special exception, the burden of proof is on the applicant to demonstrate meeting the standards and criteria. If met, the municipality has an obligation to approve that. If the applicant meets the standards and criteria, the municipality may not arbitrarily disapprove. There is the potential though that an objection can be raised about the application being detrimental to the public health safety or general welfare. That could be the basis for a denial but an objector now has the burden of proof. The burden of proof switches to an objector. And the objector must present substantial evidence on specific issues. The objector can't simply say that use is bad for the environment or that use will generate too much traffic. There's got to be, a, again, a, a substantial bit of evidence on specific issues presented in order to satisfy the burden of proof for an objection. Couple more key concepts. Uh, a zoning ordinance must permit all conceivable lawful uses. It may not exclude any of them. If you don't like junkyards, you still have to provide for them somewhere. You can choose the district in which they're located. You can make it a conditional use and apply standards and criteria, but you must permit it somewhere. Uh, municipalities have the ability to grant variances. Um, through a zoning hearing board, in the event that the ordinance may provide undue hardship, it gives the zoning hearing board a chance to grant relief. Zoning ordinance protect non-conforming uses and structures. They remain lawful, even if they were no longer lawful after the zoning ordinances were enacted. Um, two important things. In interpreting the zoning ordinance provision, if there's doubt, it's supposed to be interpreted in favor of the property owner. Another key aspect, which I get a lot of questions on, um, the, the consistency or inconsistency with the comprehensive plan is not a legal basis for a dec decision to approve or deny an application. This is very important. Even though I said earlier that a court will turn to the comprehensive plan for rationale of community development objectives and the regulations they're based on, on the other hand, if an application meets the, the rules and requirements of the ordinance, but somebody says it's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, the application's to be approved. The courts have said that the zoning regulations are what matter. A comprehensive plan, though it's valuable, it's recommendatory when it comes down to making the dec decision to approve or deny an application. Okay, really quickly, um, these are the basic roles, governing body and acts the ordinance, appoints people. Zoning officer has that task to administer and enforce the ordinance. The zoning hearing board has somewhat of a quasi judicial role. Uh, there is a balance and a separation of powers very similar to our constitution if you're looking at it, our federal government. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick and Nick's gonna talk about uh, multi-municipal and county planning and zoning. Thank you, Denny. Um, 
I mean, as Doug said at the beginning, you know, when he was reading over the Allegheny County, you know, he read 105 zoning ordinances in Allegheny County alone. Uh, and Pennsylvania is very, I would say, sort of unique in that every municipality has their own um, uh, zoning and comprehensive plans. And one thing at the state that we're continuing to try to push is looking towards more multi-municipal planning. Uh, working with your neighbors. Um, these are voluntary, of course, and they're done through intergovernment cooperation agreements. Um, but this allows you to look at not only your municipality, but the municipalities next to you who generally have similar issues and, and are built in similar ways. And this allows you to work together to then uh, have additional powers and benefits of, um, such as uh, you know, planning and having uh, all land uses sort of looked at in, in, in more of a broader, wider uh, band. You can do the next one then. Um, so multi-municipal zoning. So of course, uh, if you are, if you have a multi-municipal comprehensive plan, uh, that also allows you to do multi-municipal zoning. Um, and there's sort of two ways of doing it. You can do a joint zoning agreement, uh, and this allows, this is one ordinance that is enacted by, that covers multiple municipalities. Um, and this allows for the benefit of participating in a multi-municipal zoning is that all land uses are planned uh, at more of a multi-municipal scale. And this allows for a region um, to assume fair share of land uses within the entire planning area uh, as, per, as opposed to just one local municipality. So if you have three or four municipalities zoning together, you just need to uh, have all uses, all land uses within that multi-municipal plan. So not every municipality will then have to provide for every land use. And that's one of the huge benefits is it allows you to space out and, and not, you know, some of our boroughs are only a certain, you know, size and that allows for each municipality to really have a fair share of um, all land uses within an ordinance. Uh, and I think that is really one of the huge benefits of planning uh, at a multi-municipal scale. Uh, to allow for the fair share uh, of the region. And then county zoning, Pennsylvania is also unique that in county zoning, uh, counties have the power to enact zoning. Uh, the MPC limits the power to areas of, um, of the county. It only allows them to enact. So county zoning, uh, it, what it does is if a municipality has its own zoning, it doesn't uh, then, uh, that zoning ordinance for the county does not relate to that single municipality. However, it does allow, if the county does have zoning, that those municipalities that do not have zoning uh, then fall under the county zoning. However, in Pennsylvania, it's sort of unique because county zoning is a little different that uh, in any municipality, uh, which, sorry, um, county, so the, how county zoning is different is they don't have to zone for the entire county. They also can pick and choose certain areas of where they zone. So for instance, in Indiana County, um, they only zone, or Somerset County, I believe, they only zone a certain highway section, so a 10 mile highway section. So they don't zone for the whole county. They only pick specific areas that they do zone. Uh, other places like Fayette County, they have zoning for the entire county. And if each individual municipality does not have their own zap zoning, then the county zoning is for the purpose of that. Okay. So uh, we're down to um, the basic question of regulating oil and gas uses. And the Pennsylvania courts have said that it's up to each municipality to consider its character and its economic and environmental interests and proactively enact the zoning that addresses oil and gas uses. 
the focus, what the court has said, the focus mainly because of the preemptions in the Oil and Gas Act, on the focus of local zoning is on the where of oil and gas uses as opposed to the how generally, not totally, but generally. Here are the probably the key questions in, in thinking about regulating oil and gas uses in your zoning ordinance. Question number one, in what zoning district are the oil and gas uses appropriate? Again, as we mentioned earlier, if you've done your comprehensive plan and you thoroughly analyze the character of your community, you may have determined that certain areas of the community are appropriate and zone them certain ways and they are appropriate for a gas well and gas exploration and maybe other areas are not. The next question, should oil and gas uses be permitted by right, by conditional use or by special exception? As we talked about earlier, the, the ordinance has the opportunity to designate it as any one of those three uses. Again, permitted by right, uh, the, uh, the zoning officer would, it would have the ability to make a determination that it meets the requirements of the ordinance and approve that use. By conditional use, uh, oil and gas activities would have to meet additional express criteria and standards, have a hearing held, and be approved potentially with additional reasonable standards or reasonable, reasonable conditions. Which one, if you, again, since I said conditional uses and special exceptions are essentially the same, which one do you choose? I, this is my own opinion, my own professional opinion, that the conditional use is the better route to go. The conditional use is acted on by the governing body. The governing body is most commonly involved in the decisions about land use and development in the municipality. The governing body enacts the zoning ordinance. The governing body would enact a subdivision and land development ordinance. The governing body would approve a subdivision or land development plat whenever somebody comes applying to develop. Why then would you not also involve the governing body if you wanted to have a use that has additional standards and criteria and a conditional use? Uh, the Zoning Hearing Board has a different role. It's more set up to make sure that a zoning ordinance is fairly administered. Um, the Zoning Hearing Boards, um, um, I think, act more better in that instance and, um, and I think that they're not well designed. I think there's, if you, um, frankly, I think there's a common reason why uh, these types of uses might end up as a special exception. And that is because the, um, the municipality wants the zoning hearing board to take the heat <laughs> on a tougher matter. So they pass on a, a gas well decision as a special exception. So the zoning hearing board takes the heat. Uh, when I'm king, I'm going to eliminate special exceptions. So you can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> and the last question I think is if you do permit an oil and gas activity by conditional use or a special exception, what are appropriate and reasonable express standards and criteria? What's important here, and I, again, I believe you're going to learn more from the panel on Monday, how do you balance the rights of the landowner and the rights of the citizens? How do you balance your municipal objectives and those environmental rights amendment obligations that the court has said are important? And how do you address the preemptions of the oil and gas law? Uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Nick and Nick's gonna talk about the assistance that he provides. Uh, yes, um, so I am Nick Madrick. I am the DCD planner for Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and my role is to really help uh, local governments with technical assistance and provide help with not only reviewing zoning, but also you know, looking at comprehensive plans and um, really just providing any assistance and help and answering any questions you may have about the MPC. Uh, my role at DCD is as sort of the you know, uh, the holder of the MPC and helping to answer questions based on that for local municipalities. 
And, you know, I took this position after Denny retired. And Denny is a, a wonderful man that I still use as, as my resource. So he's the real, the pro around here, but he's been a great mentor and, and a great person to learn from. So I guess, Robin, we're ready for questions. All righty, wonderful. Thank you so very much. All righty. So just a few questions here. First up is for Denny. Denny, how long have you been in planning? Uh, I have, I'm not counting any longer, 41 years. I'm not sure. I did 15 years at DCED, mm -hmm. uh, 27 years in county government, and I'm now a self-employed planning consultant, having a little bit of fun with that. Fantastic. All righty. Um, I think we're going to ask this question today and on Monday to get uh, some feedback. Um, if a municipal council would like to prohibit leasing of municipal land for uh, vertical or horizontal drilling, is there a legal way that they can do this via their zoning ordinance or must this be done by a no decision for each leasing option to drill a municipal land use it receives? So what I think this person is trying to say is in, we had a situation in which there was an application for drilling underneath a park and um, the, their borough turned it down. But we have heard that there can be zoning ordinances where you can manage the land underneath saying that we don't want to lease any land, any public, publicly owned land borough or township land um, for the underground drilling part. I think they want to say, is this true? Is there a way to go about this? Or if you have any feedback for that? Boy, uh, my first thought is that a park is in a zoning district. Right. Okay, so that's the first thing. It's in a zoning district. So presumably the zoning district regulations can, can apply to that. Now, what I don't know, and I, I have not had the opportunity to look up, it might be a question for the attorneys on Monday, mm -hmm. is does a municipality have the legal ability to ignore its own regulations? Okay, that I, I can't answer here and now. But again, that uh, park would be within a zoning district. So my first thought is that zoning district could be a district that either permits or, or does not permit the oil and gas activity. Great. All right. Thank you so much. All righty. All righty. Um, just checking again for Denny again. Does the mandate that all zoning, that zoning shall protect natural and historic features include water contamination and air pollution? Uh, it's a broad mandate, so uh, I, I can't say any more than that. If there's been case law that's further examined that, I'm not aware of it. But again, it's a fairly broad authority that zoning ordinances shall protect natural and historic features and resources. So I think initially, again, the courts have been supportive, defending municipalities where they've had a rational set of objectives to do certain things and they've analyzed their character, their community. The courts have been supportive about the municipal regulation, uh, even through that broad authority. Great, thank you. All righty. One last question for you so far, Denny. What if the land zoned for oil and gas activity has buildings on it? Um, is that, is there I'm more not sure. to the question? I'm looking for a little bit of an elaboration. Yeah, on there. right. Um, well, I mean, I, I think if there's a concern, I think some areas have zoned to have put their oil and gas uh, zoning in like commercial districts where there might be some buildings. Maybe okay. it is applying to well, that. The, the fact that it's permitted doesn't give an applicant any right to demand that a building be torn down to put a well there, okay? You still have um, private obligations. Do you own the land? Who owns the land? Um, if you acquire the building and tear it down and put a well there and it's a permitted use, I guess hypothetically you could be permitted to do that, but. But, but again, um, all, all the zoning does is, pro if it's a permitted use, it provides the permission to do that use. There's a host of other things that have to come into play. Um, you might be, if you're in an older community, uh, you might have a historic district and there might be obligations about preserving that historic building. 
Um, there's going to be other kinds of environmental regulations that would have to be abided by in the development of the well. Uh, the, the zoning authority is just the permission that that use is permitted, doesn't grant uh, the applicant the ability to run roughshod over the development that's there, so to speak. Right. Okay. So it's, so, um, I see there's a little bit of elaboration. Maybe you answer. I just want to make sure. Um, it's just saying if the zone that oil and gas is going into is fully built out, are, is the municipality still meeting their fair share by providing oh. for use, even if land itself is not open? Uh, the courts do have a history of saying that um, you have de facto excluded. If, if you haven't um, directly excluded, in effect you have and ruled against municipalities in an exclusion in that case. Great, thank you. All righty. Nick, do you have any comments on that too? No. Okay, good. I was figuring we were moving right on to some of the questions addressed for you too, so. Alrighty, so Nick, not just for oil and gas, but other land uses too, would you recommend smaller municipalities start moving towards multi-municipal comprehensive plans and zoning to meet their obligations under the MPC? Absolutely. I mean, the ability to look at a, a wider base and in a, a, a larger, you know, four municipality area and really have a much smarter way of sharing land uses is the benefit for everyone and it's just overall the best way to really look at it, especially because Pennsylvania, Allegheny County is for very small municipalities and, and being able to provide for every land use in a, you know, in a one mile or two mile areas is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alrighty. Um, moving back to the underground usage. Um, do we know who and how our underground uses are regulated and controlled? We know so much about zoning is the surface activity, what's going on above but below, like the horizontal drilling. Do we know who regulates that part since that kind of is a different realm of zoning, not the zoning we're normally talking about? Yeah, I'm sorry, that's not my area of expertise and it's not Fine. something that's um, <clears throat> not something dealt with commonly in zoning. Mm -hmm. and again, I don't even, like you were implying, I don't even know that there's the authority to regulate other than, other than what the activities that are occurring. The use of land, okay, that's what you're able to regulate and things like the bulk area, location of, of buildings on the land, on the land is the repetitive theme of zoning. Mm -hmm. Great. Alrighty, it seems like a few more of our questions were talking about the, the underground aspects again, so we'll do that. If anybody has any further questions, um, go ahead and please answer the Q&A or if you want to raise your hand. Actually, if it's all right too, we'd like Doug to jump in for a second here. All right. Hello. Um, yes, and thank both of you. Thank you for such a great uh, uh, presentation. Uh, with regard to the question about underground uses, uh, I, I will say that generally speaking, and I don't really know of any specific instance where zoning is regulating what's below the surface of the earth. In other words, there's no zoning uh, for mining, for instance. If you're doing a coal mine, and uh, we all know Western Pennsylvania, we're very heavily undermined. These mines go for miles, literally, underneath all of our communities. Uh, they're not regulated through zoning. I know that for a fact. I, Denny or Nick, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So it is, I would say, as a general rule, think of zoning as how the, the surface of the land is treated. Uh, and that, that's probably your best way to go. Uh, again, we, municipalities do not regulate mining. Uh, we are preempted from that. We're, we don't regulate uh, banks or insurance either. And generally the rule of thumb is if it's a statewide activity that the local governments cannot regulate it and that's appropriate. Uh, but uh, on the other side of the coin is that if it is a, a use peculiar to the area, the region, what have you, then yes, it does become subject to zoning and land use regulation of the municipality. So yep. it is on the surface. So I would kind of run in that direction. 
Doug, the yeah. only thing I'm familiar with that's in zoning, or I'm sorry, in the municipalities planning code that addresses subsurface rights is there was a newer amendment to the planning code in uh, 2015 or thereabouts, maybe a couple years earlier, that requires that upon request of a landowner or the owner of the subsurface rights that uh, a municipality notify that landowner or owner of subsurface rights if it's uh, entertaining a zoning amendment mm -hmm. that affects that those rights. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I'm aware of that deals with subsurface rights. In an instance like that, the, the owner of the subsurface rights would actually have to request the municipality, please notify me and provide the municipality with self-addressed stamped envelopes or an email address for which to be notified. And then I have a, a question for Nick, and, and I'm glad you brought up the comprehensive planning aspect to all this stuff uh, and uh, joint municipal planning. Uh, Allegheny County has, by my count, 40 municipalities of the 130 that are under a square mile. And obviously, if you juxtapose that with the fair share doctrine, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, I've seen, in the codes that I've read, I've saw some very imaginative attorneys at work. Uh, yes, we will name names here. Edgewood Borough struck me as very interesting, and this occurred uh, when, I think in 2011 or 2012, shortly thereafter when Pittsburgh banned the use, which by the way, folks, Pittsburgh did not ban the use pursuant to zoning. It did it under a separate uh, part of the code. It was a bit more of a public policy issue. So um, when, when you had the borough of uh, Edgewood, for instance, which is uh, just a square mile, uh, it is probably 85, 90% residentially occupied, a uh, nice middle-class community for the most part with a shopping center along the uh, highway here at the Parkway East. Uh, but they decided that their zoning district is in their P district and they, uh, they put a zoning code in for oil and gas use in Edgewood. However, the district is located where the borough building is and across the street where a large facility, the Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf is. Obviously, neither of those two areas are appropriate for zoning, at least in, as an industrial use, but at least they met the letter of the law, certainly not the spirit of the law with fair share, because now you have to go to the private owners if you're interested in conducting drilling activity there, which is unlikely, but nonetheless, uh, then uh, it's unlikely that the borough itself would uh, open its lands up, which isn't very big, uh, or the school for the deaf is going to open its lands up for the use of, uh, you know, for uh, fracking related uses or any other industrial use. What happens to a community like Edgewood uh, when they have that situation? Uh, are they complying with the law? Are they skirting the law? How, how uh, you know, and that's certainly there's some legal context here, but from a planner perspective, how do you see that as a response? And I wanted to throw that to Nick because you, we talked about wouldn't it make more sense for Swissville, Edgewood, uh, Churchill, surrounding communities to adopt a joint plan? And as a matter of fact, there is one group of municipalities in Allegheny County that did that, and that's Bellevue, uh, Ben Avon, and Ben Avon Heights, I believe, all share a same planning commission and, uh, and their zoning code. Uh, Nick, what happens to a place like, Edge, like in Edgewood? You see plenty of towns like that in the Mon Valley. Uh, you know, they're all small. Uh, you know, mo most are under a square mile, if not under two. So how do you deal with that? I mean, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. For me, I think they're trying to at least accommodate for the land uses. The problem is, is the ability, as you said, for then that land use to actually be used makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that goes to legal and, and if, if the state sees that they are trying to provide the appropriate uh, space and, and use for the land, but it does make it very difficult in those smaller communities to, you know, to provide for it's for accommodating all land uses throughout, you know, it's, it's borough. Well, my, my impression and I have a question from the audience right after this, but if you are uh, back in 1968, the state legislature did a good thing, and they promoted the idea of joint comprehensive plans, joint zoning, uh, and they made further amendments after that. 
Uh, my, my take is there's never been a real impetus to do that. And we know how everybody can be parochial. Oh my God, you're from Dormont, I'm from Mount Lebanon. Oh, you know, we have the Berlin Wall between us. You know, we couldn't possibly sit down together. You know, it's almost like dealing with a foreign country, uh, but they're neighbors, right? And they're in the same place. Uh, I've never seen any reason to do joint planning and zoning until today because of the nature of unconventional drilling is, is that it is so big. This is not a McDonald's that sits on a corner that we understand how it interacts with the community. Uh, we don't, what we, you know, a lot of people think about a drill pad, but people don't think about uh, gathering lines. They don't think about the midstream where there's the compressor stations that may be located there instead of a well pad, cryogenic plants and so forth. So it kind of takes out a broader approach. And, and to me, uh, moving your municipalities, particularly the smaller ones to begin to do joint planning and land use together becomes more rational thing to do. And of course, some people might go, this smacks of metropolitanism. I always heard that line in my career. You know, Gee, we can all work together. No, that's evil. Uh, but, you know, obviously the state legislature made that statement quite a while ago. And the, the current legislature isn't in any mind to change that. Uh, and, you know, how does the state help municipalities when they want to do that, move into that? Because there's going to be a cost to that. Does the state support that with financial support, things like that? So I'll put, so even through this, you know, COVID-19 situation and local government finance is taking a hit, you know, with, you know, EIT and that kind of thing mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I work at this, uh, the department I work for is really the center for local government services. And we have a whole financial team who helps with local government finances. And one thing that I keep hearing is about not only shared planning, but shared services. And it's something that's very, you know, controversial and many communities don't want to even talk about it but in the long run it helps communities save money it also helps them plan better and 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 really it's a way of you know saving money unfortunately is there a lot of money to help these efforts there's not a lot i mean we do have our you know municipal assistance program which is a grant that i help run that you know helps to provide some funding for you know, multi-municipal comprehensive plans and, you know, updating your zoning ordinances. But, you know, the real pool of money is not as large as we would like to be able to really, you know, be efficient and help as many communities as, as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, you know, the multiple municipal assistance program grant that I do um, or help with is, you know, we look for multi-municipal comprehensive plans. They're sort of go to the top of the list because, you know, we see that people are working together. It's a benefit for everyone. Thank you. And, and we are, now we have a quick question. What is that? My dear friend, Robin. All righty. Nick, when are public hearings required and how are residents notified? Yes. So um, public hearings, once an application comes in, there, there is a, the FTC does require that uh, decisions are made within 90 days. Uh, generally, um, based on um, each municipality, they make the decision of when the, the, the public hearing will be. Generally, it's within 30 to 60 days after an application comes in. Uh, they have to post it both in the local newspaper as well as um, most of them do it on their uh, local websites as well. I'd like to add to what Nick just said, uh, there's going to be different requirements on public notification and hearings, depending on whether it's a special exception or conditional use, or we're talking about the land development application that might be submitted. And if it is a special exception or a conditional use, there must be a hearing held. And um, that hearing must take, I think, there's requirements, there's specific requirements in the MPC for that hearing. Uh, and they're worth noting because if you fail to follow the process, there's a deemed approval at the end of the line. Okay. Great. Alrighty. Um, we have a question here from the audience again. Um, what about developing a civil rights ordinance like CELDEF, like Doug did eight years ago in the city of Pittsburgh? We get this question a lot, but we'd love to hear from both of you and uh, maybe even from Doug himself. <laughs> Ooh, <stay> away, <laughs> Just a, to clear, clear that up. That's a little revolutionary. 
I, I have no opinion to offer on that, honestly. I'm still brand new to Pennsylvania, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say that uh, our two planner folks here are not going to wade into my revolution of uh, 2010 with my assertion of community rights. But that's an interesting case to follow, too. And the Grant Township case uh, proved to be very, very interesting as far as that goes, because they adopted essentially the same ordinance. But we'll follow that along and take that up with the lawyers more than, uh, than our planner folks. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, but you know that that's a public policy matter, and we got a long way to go before we arrive at that. Um, one thing I do want to ask, and this is about South Hills communities, um, and we, we're coming close to our end of time, is that I'm looking at uh, Bethel Parks Code, and uh, they have a section six nine one nine in their zoning code, and it says prohibited uses. And while maybe the city of Pittsburgh adopted something pro prohibited to use based on a so, you know, more of a rights based uh, type of thing, not zoning, but they prohibit, um, going down the list, holy mackerel, 57 things. Anything from uh, slag dumps, car roofing, waterproofing manufacturer, stockyard strip mining, uh, riding academies are prohibited, potash manufacturing, paint oil shellac, shellac manufacturing, open air theaters, none of those, uh, oil cloth and linoleum manufacturing, which is booming these days, right? You know, everybody needs their oil cloth. Um, Gunpowder, fireworks, explosives. Is that a legally enforceable ordinance? If I was a firework manufacturer and I found a nice place in Bethel Park to do that, could I file a substantive validity challenge uh, would these be legal prohibitions in their zoning code in Bethel Park? If you're saying, Doug, they're totally prohibited in the municipality? Yep, that's it. It says 6919 prohibited uses. It was adopted, uh, uh, doesn't say the year, is uh, amended by ordinance number 51280B. And right. uh, it basically says the following uses are prohibited and hereby excluded from the entire municipality. Okay. Uh, and it lists 57 things. Okay, Pennsylvania. Including a boarding house, which I don't know if that's legal at all. You Pennsylvania it. case law is very well developed on this, going all the way back to the 1960s, that municipalities have an obligation. If the use is otherwise lawful, it needs to be accommodated somewhere, somehow mm -hmm. in the zoning ordinance. Now, you know, how the scenario plays out is that there's no zoning police. I mean, Nick doesn't have the role of zoning police and he doesn't run to Bethel Park and cart them away for having 57 prohibited uses. It will take a private property owner or a citizen to challenge that in the court of law. And then I guess my best belief is that that will be voided in a court of law as violating um, a strong tenet of Pennsylvania zoning law. And this would probably be under the exclusionary uh, part of that and or, right. and or the uh, lack right. of fair share doctrine for those uses. And this is a common problem for a lot of municipalities. Uh, we kind of ran into that in Franklin Park and after a process there, um, the council came to realize that, wait a minute, after they really understood what was going on, wrote a letter to the governor and uh, their representative, Mr. Terzai, and their state senator, which to my knowledge has not yet been replied to. This was written in September of last year. And they said, we're not in a position to do that. And they were asking the state legislature to begin to address that. So I just throw that as a comment uh, in uh, that how, how this isn't working for us. I mean, there's a state law that kind of covers everything, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of Allegheny County and 130 municipalities, the practical impl impl implementation of that state statute becomes extremely difficult. And that goes for what Nick's talking about. You know what? Bethel Park, Dormont, Mount Lebanon, which has no zoning ordinance at all about oil and gas, might do well to all get together and work out a plan together. Uh, rather than building walls up around each other and be a little turfy about it. So that I'll just leave it go at that. Anything else? For the good of the cause, as we say. 
Nope, that about does it. Uh, thank you so much, Denny and Nick. It was such a pleasure having you. What we're going to do now is take a quick break. We will come back in 10 minutes, but in the meantime, we will have a poll question up if we could have our attendees just answer it as they go along. And if you have any questions, please feel free to still drop them into the Q&A and we will see everybody back here in 10 minutes. And I have one thing to say. Thank you to Nick, who's on vacation. They took his yes. time, and they, there's a family out of state right now, and he got up this morning and did this while he's on vacation. Yeah. So Thank you for going on vacation. Thank employee. you for doing this while you're on vacation. Uh, for the tax. Hey, Doug, I have a couple of questions in my chat that I sent to you.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. Hope you all had a chance to stretch your legs and a little refreshment, let out the cat. So we're gonna move right into our conversations with elected municipal officials. Uh, first, I would love to let you know that we do have the results up of the poll. And um, it looks like about 43% of you so far attending this webinar are confident that your community has a protective zoning ordinance, which is fantastic. We are really excited to see that. For the 28% uh, that are either unconfident or very unconfident, please don't hesitate to uh, contact us to help you out with that at all. We'll point you in the right direction. Alrighty. So starting off with our local municipal officials, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pat Patricia DeMarco. Dr. DeMarco is a native of Pittsburgh, PA, with a doctorate in biology from the University of Pittsburgh. She has spent a 30-year career in energy and environmental policy in both private and public sectors. Uh, she is a Rachel Carson Scholar and has served as Executive Director of the Rachel Carson Homestead Association and Director of Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham U University. She holds the Office of Vice President of the Forest Hills Borough Council and sits as Secretary on the Board of Trustees for Phipps Conservatory and, Bo and Botanical Gardens. Uh, next up, we have Councilmember Nicole Recito of Jefferson Hills Borough. Uh, Nicole has been a public school teacher in Pennsylvania for the past 24 years, and she is employed at South Park School District as the middle school library media specialist and career and education coordinator. Alrighty. She is a now a newly elected council person in Jefferson Hills. Alrighty. Also, we have the pleasure of having council member Dave Vento from Plum Borough. Dave Vento has been a Plum resident for over 40 years. Dave and his wife, Kathy, moved to Plum because of the school district, affordable housing, an abundance of green space, and a family-oriented community. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Commissioner Joseph Horowitz, who has served on South Fayette's Township Commission for the past nine years. He is currently serving as the commission's vice president and was also past president. He was first elected to commission in 2012 and 2019. All righty. And also Doug will be joining us for a moderator, as a moderator for this discussion. But first, I would love to hear from Dr. DeMarco first as she has prepared us some slides for um, this portion of section. Robin, you need to allow me to do my video and to share screen. Sure thing. Okay. There we are. And I, uh, hello everybody. I uh, am delighted to be with you today to address this really important problem. And I have prepared some images to help um, visualize what we're doing here. Uh, so I'll just open this a minute and uh, go. Okay, so our whole focus on this discussion is how we protect our communities and how we govern in the public interest. And fracking has really presented a challenge in this regard for all of us. This is in Montoursville, PA, and this is 100 feet, give or take a bit, between the drilling and the houses. This is exactly what we don't want to happen in our communities, and it, it will happen if we don't take actions to prevent the industry doing whatever they please. Marcellus Shale is a development that happened because the industry was enabled by the National Energy Act of 2005, which contained the, what is called the Halliburton loophole uh, that gave exemptions for uh, industrial oil and gas hydraulic fracturing from the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act that governs toxic wastes, and several worker and public health and safety provisions of OSHA. And these exemptions are what allowed legal use of hydraulic fracturing in our land. Uh, before this time, before 2005, that was not a prohibited activity. These, these requirements of the federal laws cover all other industries, including cement making, coal mining, all kinds of other things that are industrial activity. But this particular hydraulic fracturing was exempt from all of these protections under the direction of uh, Vice President Cheney. I have been an objector to this industry since 2006. Um, 
and I am confident that we have better choices for our future. So that's what I want to focus on here. We need to protect our communities. Uh, I attended one of the oil and gas industry um, conferences in the early times in 2007 and 8, and they were talking about in order to fully develop the Marcella Shale play, they need a one mile by two mile grid with 10 to 16 wells per cell to fully develop their resource. This is what that looks like in New Mexico, where tr fracking began early and where they have pretty much flat land, and you can see the area is completely inter interlaced with um, welling operations. And you see this little hole here in the middle of the frack field in Pennsylvania. This is where the city of Pittsburgh began by banning fracking and the areas in its immediate area and Forest Hills is in this area as well. We are uh, one of the areas that have banned fracking. Um, we have, I think, all of us who are elected take an oath to defend the Constitution of Pennsylvania. And I take that very seriously. Article 1, Section 27 gives the people the right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. The Constitution, in my opinion, prevails over individual laws. And so in our community, we're a tree city. We uh, encourage pollinator friendly uses of, um, of residential land. This is the garden club of uh, the borough. Um, the borough has two garden clubs. This is the late bloomer garden club public gardens. Um, we have encourage a farmer's market that brings um, locally grown uh, produce into the community from um, April until October. And the trees are bigger than the houses. We value our uh, ambiance of an environmentally friendly and a natural, safe, healthy environment. It's really important to our community. We have no industrial zone in our town. We are mostly a residential community. As you can see here, these are uh, senior housing and these are uh, multi-family condominiums. Um, this area with the red arrow, I want to come back to that area because that is our uh, designated conditional use area. Uh, we lie along Ardmore Boulevard, which goes to the turnpike in this direction and snakes right through the middle of town down to Turtle Creek in this direction. So the Edgar Thompson development that will be, um, that is under discussion for Versailles and the Edgar Thompson works would be down just below us. So this corridor will be affected by the fracking activity that will go on there. Our borough parks, uh, this one in particular, uh, centrally located. This one is um, uh, also a park area. Uh, these are significant because um, these lands were initially designated and donated by Westinghouse, especially this one. And the uh, EQT obtained the mineral rights when Westinghouse gave over the land. That's a significant issue, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we initially banned fracking in 2011. Here's our mayor, Marty O'Malley. Um, we were very active in uh, early movements to not have fracking in our community. We banned it and uh, it was supported by our concerns with the environmental problems as well as with health and safety issues. Even as early as 2011, there was considerable evidence, especially from Colorado, that um, endocrine disruption, water contamination, air contamination all had health harms. We also were concerned that we don't have a great deal of open space in our town and that it is a bedroom community and it was totally inappropriate activity for our community. So that, um, the risks that justified that ban uh, included the fact that we have a tremendous potential for landslides. A lot of our community is on steep slopes and has filled land and it's destabilized already by heavy storm runoff. This is the section of Route 30 along Electric Avenue that collapsed in a landslide in April just a couple of years ago. They're very concerned that the hydraulic fracturing and the seismic testing would destabilize already compromised areas. And we also have this whole area under the P Pittsburgh coal seam. 
um, we are heavily undermined. Uh, when we were building the geothermal um, heating system for our new borough building, uh, we did the, the test bores for what we had planned to have 1,250 foot geothermal wells. We hit the coal mine at 95 feet. Not on the map, nobody had it there. We had to completely reconfigure our geothermal field. Great concerns about what would happen if you do hydraulic fracturing under this heavily mined land because of the potential for subsidence or mine collapses or other, other kinds of damages. Um, finally, we were concerned about the emissions. We are already in a um, high pollution area, um, partly because of the Clareton Coke Works. Um, and we have many existing uh, operations in the Mon Valley for which we are in the airshed. Additional volatile organic emissions from hydraulic fracturing activities would further compromise the health and safety and well being of our citizens. So, those were the reasons we adopted a ban. And we also were concerned this is our main street. It's pretty narrow. You can see the buildings and the sidewalk are pretty, pretty close to the traffic. To have two-way heavy truck traffic on this space would just be completely hazardous to all concerned. Uh, we do worry about that even with fracking in our neighboring communities, not only from the diesel pollution, but because the buildings are, are close, the sidewalks are narrow, the buildings are close to the edge of the road. So we adopted a, a zoning ordinance um, and uh, some of the things that were uh, unique in that that are important to consider, um, not only is it a conditional use uh, in a very limited location, that very small part of the um, business district at the bottom, uh, it has two buildings on it, but we have a provision that we can obtain expert consulting and engineering services if we ever get an application and that the costs are assessed to the developer. There's no way you want to take on this industry with your local zoning code enforcement officer and your local attorney as the only help you have. You need to get expert advice and the industry has to pay for it. And that's in our ordinance. We also prohibited, um, sorry, we prohibited altogether in specific areas. Uh, in the floodway or within the 100-year floodplain, that's pretty much the whole town because Thompson Run runs right down the middle. Any property subject to conservation easement or open space conditions, and again, the uh, Forest Hills Park runs all the way along one edge of, of uh, Ardmore Boulevard, which would be a prohibition area. Geologically sensitive areas, we consider because of the coal mining underneath our area that a lot of it is geologically sensitive and because 40% of our land is subject to possibility of landslides, we considered it a geologically sensitive area and a biological diversity. We don't have it, um, we don't have it defined that way, but we do value our trees and our natural environment. So October 19th, 2016, we adopted a zoning ordinance because of the Robinson ruling, where um, our attorney assured us that our fracking ban would not stand up to a court challenge. And also because EQT began making inquiries about drilling in our parks. And so we needed to get an ordinance in place so that we would have a way to be very stringent about controlling this activity. Uh, we do have a setback requirement of 600 feet to the nearest building um, because in the area that we designated for conditional use, if you go more than 600 feet, you're going to be outside the boundaries of the town. Uh, so we also required emergency evacuation plans and closed loop storage and treatment for all wastewater, no discharge on site, no disposal pits or wells. This is a deal breaker for most frackers. Um, although closed loop water management is common in um, places like Sweden and, 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 you know, a lot of European countries, here it is not, and it's quite expensive to the industry. So they would look at that. It's a completely legitimate request on our part, but they see it as a deal breaker. So I was really happy. Um, we also require pre-drilling and post-drilling water testing, and we specified what should be tested for in the water sampling. Uh, it has to be done by an independent laboratory, not by the industry laboratory. And we particularly wanted to look for these things that are um, associated with um, 
hydraulic fracturing activity from uh, fossil rock in our area. Uh, there is a lot, there's a 23 page regulation. You can find it on our um, website. I'd be happy to send it to any of you who are interested. It does track the city of Pittsburgh's regulation. Um, it was adopted pretty much in substance by Churchill as well. Um, and we put our focus on being a community and it's our vision statement in our comprehensive plan. Burial Forest Hills carries a tradition of innovation as the community grows in leadership toward a resilient future. The community values the natural beauty of its environment and enjoys the inclusiveness and diversity of its citizens, offering cultural, recreational, and educational services for all generations in a safe and secure neighborhoods. We take this very seriously. And we have built a net zero energy building. You see that it, we had zero kilowatt hours on our bill, even though our demand, um, this is the shaded area, is the demand for last year. Uh, at the end of December, we had a uh, $986 credit. And um, by the time we reached May of this year, we were creating more than we were using again. So we're carrying a credit balance on our, on our solar system. I would recommend this. We didn't um, need to raise taxes to build this building. And uh, we banned fracking and built a net zero building instead. And that's our stand on this issue. Uh, I think in these times where urgent attention to climate change is really required of us if we're to provide for our children and our future. Things like the Pennsylvania Oil and Gas Act and the Halliburton loophole in our federal act need to be rescinded. That's my opinion, uh, not the opinion of my council, but I have been working diligently for that to happen. So I will stop there. And um, these are also going to be available to you after this presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. DeMarco. It's such a pleasure hearing you speak all the time on every perspective. All right, now what I'll open up to the rest of our council members and with Doug, because I know he has a few uh, questions to get the conversation going. All righty, take it away, Doug. All right. I'll start my video. Hi. Welcome to my dear friends and colleagues here. Patricia, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, just kind of, we ran through the introductions, but on our screen is David Vento, who's a Plum Borough Council member, been uh, on the council for a while. Uh, we have Nicole Racido down in uh, Jefferson Hills Borough. She's new to her council. Uh, she said the other day, uh, I was so involved with this for so long and I got tired of going to council meetings, so I decided to run for council and then I'd have a real reason to be there. So uh, thank you for coming, Nicole. Uh, you guys can all begin to unmute too. Uh, Joe Horowitz is a great guy. Uh, he's at South Fayette Township, which is what I have used as the basis for my model ordinance that I promote, along with the addition that was provided by Environmental Integrity Project, brought up a great point about um, having a pre-application process on top of that because the statutory requirement is that after the application for conditional use exception you got 90 days and sometimes they're a little slow with getting you the information you require to make a decision uh, so that pre-application process really is uh, something we highly recommend and then again i like to point to south Bay township because one of the things that everybody and we'll get into this discussion everybody that i talked to initially in this project at the local level was oh doug we might get sued and i said well your residents might sue you too you know get, get it from both ends so get it right um <clears throat> joe horowitz you were uh pretty much uh, dogged, if you will, uh, in the courts, largely on procedural matters by range resources, which, by the way, was just pled guilty, or I should say, no low contendry. For those of you that don't know law, that's the same as a guilty plea. It just means I don't have anything to defend myself. But it is a guilty plea, nonetheless, to criminal charges brought. But during that, and, and during that period of time, Joe, tell us a little bit about how that evolved in South Fayette Township where all of a sudden, I remember having, uh, getting a call to go there, Councilwoman uh, Darlene Harris's two daughters lived there, and she said, Doug, you gotta get down there. And that's when we met. Um, what ha tell us a little bit about your experience with developing a really good conditional use exception with a great solicitor, Jonathan Kamen, uh, who wrote it, and uh, what happened with Range Resources and where you're at right now in South Bay Township? 
Sure. Thanks, Doug. First of all, I want to say the snacks aren't nearly as good this year, but you can work on that for next year. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, back, I guess it was like around 2009, 2010, um, we found out that uh, most of South Fayette was leased. Um, and we also found out that the school district had signed a lease with Range Resources. Um, so people here went um, a little more crazy, that, I think, than they did in other places because people pay a lot for their houses here um, and came here with some pretty specific ideas of where they wanted to live. And it didn't really involve um, drilling in their backyards. So um, there was pretty much an uprising in South Fayette. And, um, and part, uh, there was a group called Friends of South Fayette back then who was kind of driving the, the anti-fracking agenda. Um, but Range Resources, I, I mean, they had a lot of the community on their side as well, and, and things were pretty heated. Um, then uh, our council somehow passed a, uh, a, a anti-fracking bill at that point, um, and then a bunch of us got together and decided we were going to run for commissioner um, to make sure that that ordinance stayed in effect and, and that we could clean it up and things like that. So uh, we did and we won and uh, then it got interesting because shortly after we won um, they passed Act 13 um, and that made for an interesting year and a half until it was declared unconstitutional. Um, we weren't really sure during that time, how exactly range was going to respond to all that if they would just start drilling and ask questions later or, or what exactly they were going to do. So we're kind so of all Let me interject here just so the audience knows Act 13 was the revision of the Pennsylvania State Oil and Gas Act. And probably the most onerous uh, piece of that that was in there was it granted the oil and gas industry a use by right in all zoning districts of the Commonwealth. In other words, the local people were no longer involved in the siting or of uh, where these uses might go. Uh, nobody else had that. U.S. Steel didn't get it. Joe's Barbershop didn't get it. You know, Mary's Automobile Repair Shop didn't get it. But oil and gas got the use by right in all zoning districts. And that, 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 well, what's the point of being in on the council at that point, right, Joe? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it kind of took, you know, took the wind out of our sails to say the least. But um, through a series of miracles, and one of them being that one of the Supreme Court justices got indicted by the DA in Pittsburgh right around the right time for us to get a pl plurality decision of the Supreme Court, but everything worked out and Act 13 was uh, found unconstitutional and uh, we tightened up our, our ordinance and uh, settled some outstanding court cases and basically chased range out of town. Yeah. And uh, you do, by the way, just so everybody understands, uh, Joseph, in South Fayette Township, the ordinance does permit uh, unconventional drilling and the, as I said the ordinance is highly detailed and a lot of municipalities have utilized it uh, to model their ordinances on but they um, uh, you do allow mm -hmm. for drilling unconventional drilling in South Fayette Township correct we do I mean okay, I just so, think, but how many right. wells do you have there now zero yeah. okay because we you know I risk my case. <laughs> right I mean we put rules and regulations in place that protect our residents and they don't want to follow them so it makes it much more difficult for them to drill here yeah I, okay and then you know that and i also want to throw this now to dave vento who has a real interesting story uh plum borough we got in, uh, food and water <laughs> watch's municipal ordinance project got involved with plum borough uh, when it was announced that you know there was a, a well pad coming in uh, they were in the process of updating their zoning code. There was a comprehensive planning process. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there was not a lot of discussion in the comprehensive planning portion uh, about oil and gas until the very end of it. And that was because you were under a lot of pressure. Um, and, and, and this Councilman Vento's story is basically my... Uh, the story I like to tell is about here's what could go wrong if you don't pay attention. And in Plum Borough's case, they got a well pad uh, in an area that is zoned residential because their code was not updated since 93 and it didn't account for the use. It didn't have anything to say about if the use is unlisted, 
uh, in our use code, then it automatically becomes a conditional use exception everywhere in the borough pursuant to state law. Um, and then on top of that, uh, Penico, a local uh, outfit, I think they're headquartered in Murraysville, applied for an injection well, which are very rare in Pennsylvania. We're noted for not being geologically stable or you, uh, to have injection wells as does Ohio which has several hundred, but they cause earthquakes and other problems as well. That's documented. That's not just making stuff up. David, tell us about what happened in Plum Borough and what's happening now with the injection well. Okay, well, like Doug said, I'm, I'm the cautionary tale, so everybody please pay attention. <clears throat> First thing people have to realize is, and I'm sure my fellow panelists will, will back me up on this, People that get elected are not expert uh, in all fields, especially in this, in, right now it's, it's much more widely known, but at the time that they came, it wasn't widely known. Plum Borough had previously had many conventional wells drilled by Huntley and Huntley. They were a good partner with the community and some people made a lot of money. The borough even sold land to get free gas for our borough buildings at the time. So everything was great. So when they started coming in with the fracking, most people didn't know, the unconventional wells did not know what the difference was and they didn't care. So when I, as Doug said, I've been on council for a long time now, this is my fourth term. Unfortunately, none of them are consecutive. So I think I have some kind of a record for that. I keep getting elected, but I can't get reelected. <laughs> so that also, it also has a lot to do with continuity which you do need, you know, people that want to limit term limits, they have to think of that, you know, people can get proficient in what they're doing over time if they're let do that. And uh, if that doesn't happen, then, then you get people that don't care as much. Like when I was off the first time for four years, the, the economic development and zoning board that I have chaired every time pretty much went non-existent. The person who was there at the time didn't care, you know, so they did nothing virtually. And then when I got back on, I was told by my planning director, who at the time I knew very well, and you know, we have to catch up on this stuff. And we started the process. Then I got unelected four years and it still wasn't, fracking wasn't a, a deal then, you know, it wasn't on, the, on, our, on our radar yet. So uh, we were trying to do the, the zoning changes for our economic, we were trying to build our economic base our businesses and such in Plum Borough. We have plenty of land. Plum is the second largest borough in the, in the state. It's 27 square miles. You know, so we have a lot of this not even developed yet. Uh, over half is not developed at this time. So we do have new people coming to live in our community all the time. New houses are being built. And, and you know, that creates its own problems. So we were focused in that area. So along comes, uh, Huntley and Huntley at the time, and when, uh, you know, they got in with the uh, fracking before we had a time, and I was off at the time, and we didn't, the, the, the zoning ordinance wasn't changed to prevent them. So, okay, we were stuck with one well. Uh, at the time, we hurried, we got dug, and we, we heard about the injection well wanting to come. So we hurried to have uh, public meetings to educate ourselves on what was going on with this fracking, to get the public involved, and they all realized nobody in Plum Borough wanted an injection well. But unfortunately, we thought we had our, our zoning to, to only make them go to the resident or the, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, industrial zones in Plum, which are very small. One is down by Allegheny River. Nobody's gonna allow a fracking well that close to the river. The other one was pretty much built out. So that was found a problem by the, uh, the courts, I guess. So anyway, we didn't do enough to prevent them in the other areas. So the court, Plum Borough went to court with the, against the uh, fracking wells and uh, we, we did appeal them and, uh, originally and they, uh, they won in the Commonwealth Court. Well, first they went to the zoning. Let me interject, David. They won, just so everybody understands, the driller won because the borough's zoning code was silent on the right. matter. It didn't say anything. So that opens the door to a conditional use. And here's the other thing. If, if you meet the elements that are required for conditional use, and in this case, they didn't have any at all, 
then you must, it, it's not discretionary, you must convey the conditional use. You must vote yes. Uh, you can vote no, but they'll go to court and you'll be overturned anyway. So just some context there for David is, is that there was nothing on the books for either the well or uh, the injection well. Correct, correct. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. No, that's, uh, okay. that's why I'm here. Kind of that's good because I don't know all the details all the time anyway, just like most people don't, you know, so this is a good thing to, to have happen. And uh, so we, we lost, we, they lost at our zoning hearing board. Our zoning hearing board didn't want any wells. And then they appealed and went down to the Commonwealth Court where their appeal was upheld. They won in Commonwealth Court. We appealed uh, that decision and lost that. And then uh, we took it to the state Supreme Court and lost there. So that's how that all happened. They were allowed to start the fracking pad just one, but by this time we had updated our ordinances to, you know, to exclude them from the everywhere, but the uh, rural residential area. So the rural residential area was another thing I thought we shouldn't allow there because a lot of that property is future housing and maybe a, a commercial development zone. So I was trying to get them to stay out of there. And at the same time as uh, was it getting towards the end of my other term, and I decided to run for mayor of our community. So they used that as a, as a way, my, my, I was the only one on council that fought them, unfortunately, uh, in the fracking. Like I said, nobody wanted the, uh, the uh, injection well. So of that, we were of one mind, but the fracking wells, well, even our, I don't think even my fellow councilman understood, even after they sat through the, the meetings, what the problems were with the fracking wells, the unconventional drilling. And uh, so, you know, I lost my bid to mayor uh, because of that. Uh, it was uh, Huntley and Huntley came to the meetings the last, it was about five, four or five meetings and they really had the people that wanted the, the wells in their property. They said I was taking away their property rights to do what they wanted to do. Not that I was trying to protect the community against this, this heinous, you know, uh, what I thought was very bad to have in our community, but I was, I was taking away their property rights. So along comes my opponent, he's an ex-war veteran, a Marine, you know, he's going to save their property rights. And Huntley and Huntley gave him financial, you know, they, I think I showed Doug a copy, and he's seen it many times, of the, uh, their advertising piece that came out the weekend before the the election, and I thought I was, I, I was holding my own or ahead, I thought, you know, in the election, a lot of people were, you know, very positively responding to me, but it didn't happen. You know, he, because of, I think because of that final piece, that was the final nail in my coffin. So I lost again. And it, because I ran for mayor, I wasn't able to run for council at the same time. I could have, but I don't think that's, I don't think you should do that. So that was a personal decision by myself, not to run for both positions. So, uh, you know, I was off, I'm off again now. So I got reelected this time and I'm back and I'm uh, going through our ordinances to make sure. And it seems like our uh, setback ordinance now does in the, uh, in the residential, in the regular residential area is prohibitive enough to keep them from coming into that. They're still allowed to go in the rural residential area, but they have come back to council now uh, to ask for our, you know, permission for our, for our uh, collective, uh, give them the permission to go ahead and drill in the in the regular residential areas because they shared with us and I think from where their pad sits now they're drilling the, probably the longest well they've drilled ever in Pennsylvania is being drilled from this pad they're making a fortune from this one pad but they can't get through the rock structure to get to the other side of the community that they want to get to for more money so, you know, they're going to, it's probably right now we're still pretty friendly. We're saying, no, you know, we, we're going to allow our zoning to stand and it's still pretty friendly, but they're not going away. You know, they're going to come back and I'm sure they're going to, you know, try and get the people in the, in the regular residential areas say, well, why, you know, these people over here are making money. Why can't you? Yeah. And you know? David, just I want to interject one more time. This, the well pad that we're talking about is known as the Midas well pad. Mm -hmm. It's about... For those of you familiar with the Oakmont area where the Oakmont Country Club is, which is in Plumboro, is about two miles down the road. Uh, it's called Coxcomb 
Hill Road and Kerr Road is the intersection. So it's about two miles up the road from a uh, senior citizen uh, living complex uh, and some other things up that way. Um, the problem also was the well was drilled, I believe, in 2018 in the spring. Uh, by August, I happened to notice, along with a friend of mine from Frack Tracker, Matt Kelso, who's a resident of Plum, mm -hmm. uh, we noted that the DEP had cited Huntley and Huntley uh, as a source of some sort of contamination for local wells. I believe there's about four or five um, homes that are affected, and of course, Huntley and Huntley is denying responsibility despite the state statute that indicates that if anything goes wrong within a certain amount of space, feet, uh, within a certain amount of time, that it is a de facto, you're, you're at fault. And that's the law of the land of Pennsylvania. Uh, and Huntley is still disputing that. And the, you know, the well leaked, what can I say? Or allegedly leaked, or at least the DEP, I should say for legal purposes has uh, made a finding and that letter is on file. And uh, subsequently there are kind of working that up. In the meantime, they, I, I, presumably Huntley and Huntley, which is an enterprise, okay, fine. Uh, they seem to see Plum as a drilling field rather than as a community as a whole. Right. And uh, so that's kind of where, where they went wrong. And the other thing was, is that Plum did not take the upgrading of its uh, code seriously, as you heard from the two experts before on planning and zoning. So it's an ongoing process you know, everything changes and you got to stay ahead of the curve. Of course, we were way behind the curve because fracking started in Pennsylvania around 2006. So here we are some two decades later. Um, and uh, that's, that's what happens if you don't pay attention. So those of you who are watching, again, get back to your local official and say, and in the poll question is some of you felt confident that your borough ordinance was fine. Maybe it is. Okay. You know, unless you're an expert on these things or have some specific knowledge, it's always good to do a review and self-assessment. And I want to turn a little bit now to our dear friend, Councilwoman Nicole Recito. Nicole, you've had a long history in Jefferson Hills with dealing with uh, encroachments. And I recall a time when Jefferson Hills was in the early days, if you will, 2010, 11, was rather receptive to the idea because everybody's going to make a lot of money or whatever else, you know, it's good energy independence and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about the, your experience in Jefferson Hills and what's going on there. Sure. Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, as, as he mentioned, you know, I'm new to council as of January 2020. And, uh, also, as Doug mentioned, I feel though that prior to that date, I've been on council since 2014 because that's when I started going to meetings in Jefferson Hills. Um, one day, my husband and I saved a lot of money and bought this beautiful historic home in Jefferson Hills with a little bit of land and um, just something, a place that our family could treasure forever our kids, you know, my husband and I are both teachers. We love history. It's an older home built in 1905. We had our eye on it forever, had an opportunity, moved from Pleasant Hills to Jefferson, which by the way is all one neighboring school district together, but separate boroughs. Um, so I'm at the bus stop. I was actually off of work. It was Columbus Day, but, the, but my children had school that day. And my neighbor came up to me and said, did you hear the awful news? And I said, well, my gosh, no, what, what could that be? Well, about 500 feet across the street here, they're gonna, EQT is putting in a well. Now they say one well, that's one well with 32 heads off of that one well, which is pretty massive. That's a sizable project for a suburban community. Um, and she continued to tell me this, and that's when I started to attend the meetings immediately. We moved from Scenery Hill to move away from fracking and the problems, the dangers, the children that I had that had nosebleeds and headaches and rashes, and we left that. And here we are back at it again in suburban Jefferson Hills, where we didn't think that it could happen. Now, this is... An, an industry that they wanted to combine with our 837 corridor already, which is, uh, you know, host to one of the biggest super funds in the world from Marathon and Atlas. Um, and we have U.S. Steel 
in Clareton, right across the street as well. So imagine, if you will, what this is going to do to the already polluted air that we have here in Jefferson. Um, so with that, I kind of tried to initiate a group. We went to meetings. We did the best that we could to stall the passing of our borough ordinance, comprehensive plan, zoning map, and we did, thank goodness. And we were also fighting EQT at the same time. Uh, that's the company that infiltrated Jefferson and will continue to infiltrate Jefferson, um, as mentioned. Um, so we got the, the stall, we got all of that done. We took EQT to court and, you know, unlike Plum, we did um, appeal and we went all the way to the straight state Supreme Court. And thanks very much to John Smith, the mastermind that you'll meet tomorrow. We won in, <laughs> we won in the Supreme Court and it was a big hearing. It's a, it was a substantial ruling for our, for us and for many other communities too. Um, we had initially had overlays in our zoning map, which we're now trying to get rid of. Um, it's basically the whole surrounding area of our Jefferson Hills map provides for a conditional use for oil and gas drilling in an overlay area. And it was uh, created in 2007, as Doug said, it came here in 2006. We had, uh, I guess, previous council members and um, planning commission experts that were there had recommended this because once again, people could make money, but much like South Fayette, there are also a host of people that live here that want their children to be safe and don't want extra pollution and didn't feel the need for this industry to happen here. So for that, um, we're very hopeful uh, as we redo our ordinances and our zoning map now, we're trying to limit, you do have to provide for it as mentioned, we're trying to limit it to one area of industrial one, we do have that area down in uh, 837. Um, and that's really, you know, that's the story that we have here <laughs> in Jefferson Hills. And that's the reason that I ran for council and will hopefully continue to stay on council to uh, protect our neighborhood here. Thank and thanks, thanks to Doug, Doug's been instrumental in helping us here in Jefferson Hills, of course. Along with a lot of other people, too. Uh, we have a lot of good colleagues uh, out there. I, I want to give credit also to Lisa Graves Marcucci at the Environmental Integrity Project, which has also been, she's terrific in working with ordinances and we've done really well. One of the questions that I'd like to pose to all of you is this, is that, well, let me back up. One, one observation that I'm making here, especially going back to David, Councilman Bento's experiences, is that being unprepared for this, doing nothing, costs you a lot of money. I mean, making yes. Supreme Court filings, Commonwealth Court filings, let's say that the attorney's giving you a break on the price, you're <laughs> still paying a lot of money. Uh, so those of you that might object to some of this stuff is like, look, this is the law of the land. And one of the things that the Municipal Ordinance Project does is that we don't, we work with the laws that are on the books. We don't work with laws we wish were on the books. And so uh, having your code up to date for any particular reason, especially such an intensive land use uh, is important. Why? It saves the taxpayer a lot of money. It creates a place where both the industry and the community understand completely what's gonna happen. Rather than surprise, there's a well coming into the neighborhood and gee, uh, you know, seven months later, my well went bad. What happened here? Uh, being prepared is always, you know, that's what the Boy Scouts say. So uh, if you learn that at 12 and carry it out the rest of your life, you should be good. We're not prepared in Allegheny County. And so what I'd like to ask all of the uh, uh, panelists here to, to comment on is what advice do you give to a council member, let's say Nicole, who just got a, elected? Uh, what would be some of the most important and prudent things that you want to do when you get into office? And let's kick that off. I'll go back to Joe Horowitz and then Patty and then uh, uh, Nicole and David. 
Doug, just first off, just listening to everybody talk, it, it just reminded me, you know, I made it sound kind of easy that we did this, we did that, we did this other thing. I mean, it was awful. Um, people were ready to kill each other here. Um, Range was inciting everybody to hate everybody. Um, we got sued for our comprehensive plan. We got sued under the Sunshine Act. We got sued every which way from Tuesday. Um, and then I'm pretty sure in response to our ordinance, they passed Act 13. Um, and we had a win in the Supreme Court. And then even after that, we had about another year of nonsense. Um, I think we were finally able through mostly community outreach and you know dealing with the landowners and showing them that we weren't trying to be unreasonable about everything. It was just sort of, we disagreed on this one issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and eventually I think it just wore down, but it was definitely not um, easy. And you know, when you say be prepared, I mean, it was always trying to think you know, one step ahead of what, what they were gonna do next. I mean, it was never, again, we were legitimately worried when, during that Act 13 period that they were just gonna come in and start drilling. That's right. um, because, you know, they would argue that our ordinance was not valid because of Act 13. And, you know, luckily we got to stay um, in court, but, you know, that wasn't guaranteed either. So, I mean, it was, it was terrible. Um, and then uh, we ran for your audience. Uh, I, I think 2016 was the year that range kind of raised the white flag and kind of gave up. Well, yeah, because we, we had the battle Royale in 2015. That was what I was just about to get to. So in 2011, they weren't really prepared. They didn't see us coming. Um, so 2015, obviously they knew we were going to run for reelection. So they had, um, all the wealthy landowners basically run against us. Um, they didn't use their proxies this time. They just all ran against us. Um, and it was dirty and it was I like, it was hard. Um, I won't, I almost didn't want to run again, but you know, nobody really ran against us this time. So it was a little bit easier, but I mean, that was a, a vicious election and we had, I think 63% turnout. I can't remember exactly somewhere around that in a local election in South Bay at, in an off year, it was 2015. So, I mean, it was, it was serious, but you know, we, we stood our ground and ultimately, you know, it was one of the best things I ever did. So, you know, I just can't encourage people more to, to get out there and, and, and fight. And even if you lose, at least you tried. Thank you, Joseph. And yeah, I'm glad you emphasized that this was no day at the beach. This was a, uh, and also a testament to public service too. People, you know, knock politicians all the time. Uh, when you're a local guy with that, uh, that kind of issue, as, as Joseph pointed out, it might be a good reason not to do this anymore. And the in, in also, uh, politically speaking, in the election, as David pointed out, the industry does get involved, and they are not nice about it. And we could probably write a book about that, but we'll stop. I'll go to Patricia DeMarco, because yeah. Patricia, you, uh, you're unique in, in a lot of ways. One, you're a bona fide scientist. You're going to be on the health panel on Monday evening. Uh, moderating that. And also, uh, you're, you're an elected councilwoman in the Borough of Forest Hill, so you have a unique perspective. And, and David said something that caused me to think about you, is David's borough got free gas from Huntley and Huntley's conventional wells out there. You got free electric because you took, the borough took action. So there's still, you know, you want to be energy independent, I would say, okay, guys, weigh that out. Is it David Vento's independence or... <laughs> The Burke, you know, because now they're depending on Huntley's uh, goodwill, uh, or do you want to be like Forest Hills and take that leap into the future and make your own electric and watch the meter go backwards? I want, to, I want to lift up something that a number of my colleagues have raised, which is the real importance of public education. Um, in advance of our fracking ban in 2011, I was not yet on council, but we conducted, I think, four community awareness meetings um, about fracking, the health harms, the environmental harms. I had run a conference in 2010 um, called um, Challenging Marcellus Shale, the, the Problems and the Solutions, which went into the social as well as environmental and health issues involved with that. And a lot of, I, I invited our entire council and some of them came to that conference. Um, and I think just the fact that we had been seeing, we went on a on a um, excursion to Hickory. We had John Stoltz come in and show his pictures of what had happened. I have a colleague whose sister had her land completely ruined in Hickory. She came and explained what happened when fracking came into that area. 
And so we had a lot of um, awareness and engagement with our public before we attempted to make a change in the law. And the ban came from the council as a resolution of council. It was unanimous and we thought we were finished. Uh, well, when Act 13 happened and then we had a number of court cases that said, well, unless you have a zoning provision that satisfies the law, you can be vulnerable to, cha to challenge and we can't afford the legal fees. I mean, you look at what the legal fees are for defending yourself against some of these onslaughts. I mean, we're a mile and a half square town. There's no way fracking is gonna fit in our town, period. Nor would a cement factory, nor would any other kind of major industrial, we do not have an industrial area in our town. It doesn't work here, you know, period. So it was important to have that base of understanding. So when 2016 happened, I did run for council. We had, um, a couple of people challenge and we had a couple of people retire one person died so there was space and i sort of got on council and then that was the year in 2016 where we wrote our ordinance i had talked to my colleagues in the city of pittsburgh i talked to doug uh, we met a number of times with people who had adopted good ordinances and um i think we got special counsel for that as well because babson cleland was um also represents the fracking industry and there are um, municipal council. So we hired a special council just to do that because we didn't want a conflict of interest on our, on our, our ordinance. But we- Annie, let me interject there too, because we did have a question about that on conflict of interest with legal yeah. counsel. And uh, that's, that's a really nuanced kind of thing too. And uh, yeah. I know the legal counsel here, I actually was a paralegal at Babs County Clements and yeah. Zahn. There. Yeah. Right, bunch of well, people. they're a very diverse, large firm, but and our, yeah. our attorney was not engaged with that activity. And he was trying right. to explain there was a firewall, et cetera, et cetera, but we weren't comfortable. So the thing is. Yeah, and I just want to point out Franklin Town, Franklin Borough did the same. Uh, yeah. What is it? Franklin, Franklin Park did yeah. the same thing. Uh, they too had a BAPS Count solicitor, and graciously he backed, you know, he, he went, you know, hey, that's fine. And I think uh, he did a wonderful job. I always enjoyed speaking with him. And they, they brought somebody else in to help construct their zoning ordinance. So it's, the appearance of conflict, you know, you got to have the confidence of the people. If they feel like they're getting job, maybe they're not. But, you know, the appearance is a big deal. Yeah, we didn't see any tremendous advantage for us pursuing in any way uh, an opportunity to en endure fracking in our town. We didn't see an economic benefit. Um, the royalties were, were marginal and I had seen Tony and Grafia's um, data on the leakage from wells uh, within you know five years all of them are going to fail in one way or another and you know when you describe to the general public okay imagine this you're putting a pipe down through rock 10,000 feet and it's then going to bend and they think they're putting a secure concrete casing around that are you kidding me you know just try, I mean try doing it you know, what, by putting something down in a thing of stone and putting, you know, plaster of Paris around it and see how easy that is. It doesn't happen. I mean, it's a, it's a myth. And um, well, it just, uh, again, in Grafia's model, uh, he's a, uh, the father of rock mechanics at Cornell, for those of you who don't know him. And his model said that uh, casing failure rate is predicted at 5%. Uh, state DEP records show that the failure rate of well casings in Pennsylvania okay. is about 6% on day one. And over time, uh, concrete and steel tends to wear out. And as one old guy said to me, he said, Doug, the only concrete I ever saw that didn't crack is in a bag. Well, the thing <laughs> is, it's also being exposed to highly saline conditions. And that is known to be corrosive under the best of circumstances. So just giving these practical, uh, common sense information to the public in ways that were, you know, graphically easy to understand. I mean, we had charts and pictures. We had old timers get up there yakking away about how stuff fails. And, you know, you gain the confidence of your community by just making sure they understand what they're getting into. And we saw no clear benefit to anybody from doing this. And so it was not, um, it was a unanimous vote to pass this ordinance. Um, we felt that it was unfortunate that we had to do this conditional use 
against our wishes mm -hmm. because our intention was to make it so onerous that they would walk away and they did. Well, that, that's again for our audience and listeners out there is this is the, the conflict that bros find themselves. You know, one, ignorance is bliss and when you don't deal with it, it's as, as Joe Horowitz would say, it's probably a lot nicer. But when you do deal with it, you're gonna have to deal with these thorny issues. And I think that there's a, and I met with Senator Jay Costa a couple of years ago to explain to him, he said, look, you know, when you did the use by right in all zoning districts in the state law, which was found to be unconstitutional later and struck down, um, you know, you basically solved all the problems for the locals. They didn't have to worry about anything because they're out of the picture. But now they're back into the picture and nobody went back to the municipal planning code to make accommodations for this new and impactful and very different land use. As I said, um, so we've got about a couple more minutes. I think, David, what's your advice to a local elected official? You've been there, done that, You've been around the block a few times. You're living in a community that is, you know, I don't know how many gas wells are out and plumb on the conventional wells. You drive down the road, you see them all over. Either. Yeah, it's like a pin cushion. And, yeah. and honestly, a lot of people aren't too concerned about conventional drilling. It's been around a long time. We understand it. And it's certainly a much different creature than, say, unconventional drawing, which is, you know, going from right. very small to very large. What would be your best advice to give to your colleagues throughout well, Allegheny County? First of all, education. You know, when I didn't know enough, I had, uh, luckily, I had some contact with Doug, and he got me in, involved with John Stoltz and, and others that, that helped. We had, a, we had a big panel discussion at our borough. Doug was there. He wasn't a speaker, unfortunately. But uh, I think they kept them out for a reason. But uh, they had Stoltz and another gentleman that was a, another college uh, professor from somewhere. I forget his name. And again, but, uh, David, just for the audience, John Stoltz is a professor, uh, a biological right. whatever underground. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount of research on water impacts underground and at Duquesne University. Go ahead. Yeah, who, who by the way, offered to test water for free if people had a problem, you know, they, they wanted to find out. A great guy, and uh, obviously knows the problems associated with the fracking industry. And uh, we, we had this panel, and it was clear we had the room was pretty full with people. But uh, it was pretty clear uh, Huntley and Huntley had two people there, and we had our two. And they had a you know first they they each they each had their own time to do their thing, and then they had a little back and forth panel dis you know argument discussion. And I thought you know the people that were anti were were smarter, you know, obviously smarter and had better reasonings than the oil drillers did. Well, unfortunately, and this is another problem that most people obviously don't have on this panel, uh, since I've been on council, I've only been in the majority side of thinking and, and you know, I don't want to get politics in it, but let's just keep it to thinking. The majority side of thinking, uh, this is my third year out of uh, 12, you know, so that's a big problem. If you have a complete other side of your council that is in the majority, you have very little you can do except try to educate the community and try to let them know the real ramifications. But our other people, they were more enamored by, boy, we can, uh, we're gonna get this impact fee from every one of these and boy, we're gonna get rich. Well, the, the impact fee is infinitesimal compared to what they make. And if you do get the impact fee from multiple wells, we haven't yet. We only have one. So there's only one impact fee. We don't get anything for them to come in and inject their, if the injection well ever starts to produce, we don't get anything for the injection process except wear and tear on our streets, you know, with tractor trailers and big you know, for earthquakes. So what would you tell a local official to do? Fight, fight, fight. I don't see any good in this process for a local community at all, check your zoning ordinance periodically, I'd say yearly, to make sure you're covered in this area because they're constantly trying to get things to change from their end. So if you become unaware of a quick change that's made, like when all these ordinances were, were put up and then they were deemed unconstitutional, you have to be able to be on top of that. Hire a, a separate attorney for this instance because you can have the best solicitor in the world but just like councilmen are not professional, neither uh, in this issue, especially, neither are all attorneys that, you know, completely up on this issue. So you need to hire, you know, 
That was another thing. Cost is thrown in your face. What's this going to cost us? Oh my God. You know, we spent $32,000 appealing this case. Well, you know, that's, that's nothing. And when we start to have problems, $32,000, although a decent amount of money in our budget is infinitesimal also, you know, we can spend more. We just did a, we just did a, uh, a survey of our community to how many people want us to continue to fight the fracking well and be like, uh, Grant Township was, if, you know, right. was able to do that. So it's like, yeah, it, so the, the bottom line here is, is that you really do need to, to be rigorous in your, yes. uh, and I'll say this, one of the things that I took note of is that maybe with our uh, malaise economically here from the late 60s, 70s and 80s, the loss of industry and everything, there wasn't a lot going on in municipalities, except for maybe building out residential subdivisions uh, and as a result, there was no real impetus to go look at your zoning code. Right. And now, now there's an impetus to do so. And especially if you're a municipality, Mount Lebanon, they have absolutely nothing on the books at all about any of this stuff. <laughs> and I, I always tell people, whether you're for drilling or for fracking or whatever it is for or against, it really doesn't matter. If you don't have any rules to the games on the books, you're really playing with fire um, uh, in your municipality. And you're losing the ability to define the character of your community uh, in, in doing so. Nicole, hey, I'm going to jump to you. Um, did I get everybody? I got Joe. Patty. Hey, Doug, can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. So, you know, just hearing this, it reminds me, this is really the ultimate David versus Goliath thing. I mean, there's five of us who make $200 a month um, against a billion dollar industry. Okay. Um, I make 25. This, right. The Speaker <laughs> of the House just. Um, got a golden parachute to go work for uh, people's gas after right. pillaging our state for however long. Yes. So this is what you're up against. Just don't give up. It's worth it. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. And Nicole, what do you see? And then I'm going to have one more question and then we'll go to Q&A from everybody else. Um, just new and learning. Uh, I have come to the conclusion that as my colleagues have stated here, education is the most important thing. There are a lot of people in our community that had no idea what unconventional drilling was at all, being in Allegheny County. Our family coming from Washington County was very familiar with it, unfortunately, but they, they just think that it's a shallow well that might be, you know, over the hill from them. They have no idea the impact and what, and technically on paper, how industrial this process is. Mm -hmm. with the traffic and the noise pollution and the sound pollution and all the other things that come into play. Um, so and education- Once in a while they blow up too. <laughs> yeah, once in a while they blow up too. It's a free pizza, you know, or something. Uh, it's just, you know, you would be, I was very surprised at what little the community knew about it. Mm -hmm. um, and once they become familiar with it, most of them realize that this isn't what they want in their backyard because you have the people that don't, aren't con so concerned with the environment like my family is and other people are, but they care about their money here and their house values and <laughs> they don't want that to happen. So that's a big sales pitch for this to not be around in your community. Um, and I will say as, as, as far as um, attorneys are concerned, Find, find yourself, if you happen to be on council or get elected, find yourself an honest solicitor, someone that you can rely upon, someone that knows about these things and can help guide you in the right direction and the right path. We did not have that before, now we do. So uh, Darren Gabriel has been amazing and knowledgeable and helpful and that 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 would be you know education and finding the right help yeah. are yeah. two big things and don't forget <laughs> to watch is here to help community meetings. exactly the exactly council meeting does it we'll work with the council too that's the other good thing let's take some questions from the audience right now robin martin you're standing by with some questions how are you uh, let's hear from you 
right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So actually, Nicole, if it's all right, we'll stick right with you. Uh, with your experience as a school teacher, how do you think we can start bringing school districts into these conversations as it relates to development near our schools? Well, that's sort of uh, initially how this became an issue in our community is we have a huge uh, landowner who has property that butts up against our new high school that we were building. And once parents found out that this was gonna be in the backyard of the new school, which they had to pump, I can't even imagine how much um, sediment in to underneath to settle this. If, you know, if there was fracking that would happen behind it, it, it may not withhold all of that, the impact from, from the industry. So parents became concerned and we were fortunate that we did get to have a meeting with our superintendent and he was very uh, accepting to listen to us and he sent a letter out to the community on our behalf. And he, he did get a little bit of heat for that, but most of the people thanked him for doing that because they had no idea that this was gonna be happening. So it is very instrumental for you to talk to your school board go to school board meetings, let the school board know, let the superintendent know, let go to PTA meetings. I got a lot of parents in my group by attending a PTA meeting, which I don't usually <laughs> attend because school is my life. I don't want to go talk about ice cream flavors in the cafeteria at night, you know, <laughs> but I went and <laughs> I got a lot of um, concerned mothers and that's where you start. So school is, school is very, uh, an important first step for sure. Great, wonderful, thank you so much. All right, next question is for Councilman Horowitz. Uh, I, you might've answered this, but just to spell it out, after all these years of litigation, does your protective ordinance still stand today? It does, yeah, it's unchallenged too. It's pretty outstanding. That is good. happy every day. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. DeMarco, with your wealth of experience and expertise, do you have any resources and research that you would like to share with other elected officials to base more of the uh, setback decisions on? Well, I'm happy to share our ordinance with anyone who would like it. Um, I also have written a number of pieces about the harms of fracking and the alternatives to fracking, um, the lost opportunity costs, uh, which we spent a lot of time debating. Um, it, you know, when you're a small town and you have limited land available for development, you need to be realistic about what makes sense in your community. And uh, right now we're working on moving our business district, which is pretty much strip mall retail, originally from when the streetcar ran down Ardmore Boulevard and people would get off the streetcar and shop on their way home or could walk to those shops. Now that is not the pattern of behavior in our community or any other community. So we're looking at putting um, a high-tech office corridor there and we're working with Wilkinsburg to make that happen. So it's in the early stages of planning at this time, but be realistic about where the value is in your community. And certainly adding industrial development to a community such as ours is not seen as a positive initiative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, storage units, not a positive initiative. So we're trying to look at a different way forward. Um, our comprehensive plan had um, close to 200 people participate either in the survey or in the actual community meetings. Went on through almost all of 2018 and 19. Um, and I think we have a pretty clear idea of where we want to go. And it certainly doesn't include fracking. So. Um, <laughs> That has been, um, uh, I think, the best way to answer those kinds of concerns is to have a real positive idea of what you want. And then that gives you a real good chart for making decisions about what you don't want. I would be very happy to see pressure on the Pennsylvania legislature to rescind Act 13. I, I feel that it's unconstitutional and even the limitations that we are required to accommodate all uses unless we explicitly prohibit them or make accommodation. I think it, it's just really an affront to the ability of local people to determine their fate. And um, I would go farther to say that uh, the 1837 history of giving 
access to mineral rights as a right needs to be reevaluated as we're looking at the urgency of dealing with climate change because the ecosystem services that are our life support are in the surface of the land. The fresh water, clean air, fertile ground, these things that we need for our life are not, you know, subservient to the mineral rights where those things can be destroyed willy nilly so that somebody can drill. I don't think so. I don't think so. We have to invert that priority and say, when you're dealing with wetlands and groundwater that charges drinking water aquifers with forests and farmland that we're gonna to need to feed people and to, to buffer the air, uh, those things have to take priority for the survival of our children. And we need to start challenging these ancient laws from the 1800s that give rights of despoiling the land for whose benefit? Okay, a lot of these are, I'm sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now, but um, a lot of these are multinational corporations and the benefits of this extractive industry do not come to our local communities. What they give us as, you know, remediation for the damages, the pains compared to what they actually cause to the basic life support system that we all depend on. Great. Thank you so much. That's invaluable. Yeah, I'll put my website in the uh, thing. And you can dig in there. There's lots of tracking information in there, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Doug, we have a few questions for you here. So does an injection well have to be in an industrial, an industrial area for oil and gas? For me? Yes. I'm muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I took up a lot of time talking and didn't get anything. Oh, boy. Um, the question is uh, about uh, injection wells and can they be put anywhere besides an industrial zone? The answer is yes. And that is because in the Middlesex case, a Supreme Court decision, Middlesex Township's up north of Pittsburgh near Mars area, that area. Basically, in that decision, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the right of the local government to allow drilling in 95% of the township. If Joe Horowitz wanted to, uh, and his colleagues, he had a majority of council to allow fracking pretty much unfettered as a special exception in uh, South Fayette Township, just about everywhere and anywhere, then that stands. Maybe, the, you know, maybe they'll lose the election down the road, but anything established during that period when the law said it could, then it would stay. It's grandfathered then. So technically speaking, it's up to you, the resident, to ultimately decide where things go by way of your governing body. Your governing body is not there to rule you. It is there to represent the interests of the community. And if you stay home all the time, they won't know what you want at all. So they may make a mistake. And you know, if you're not giving input uh, at the local level, then believe me, there's a lot of good elected representatives out there that make 200 a month or nothing, or a lot less than certainly I made in city council, uh, who dedicate their lives to these communities. And um, believe me, it's not a good thing to sit up late at night and wondering where the community wants to go. You gotta give them input. So technically speaking, it's an industrial use. I don't think there's any question about injection wells being an industrial use. The Supreme Court called unconventional drilling an industrial use. So guess what? Under a zoning scheme, they should be in your industrial zone. The problem is, is that when you don't have an industrial zone, what do you do? And I think that's what uh, Councilwoman DeMarco over here in Forest Hills and others, you know, all our panelists have decided that we're going to put it in a specific place and protect ourselves from the harms that would be emanating from this. And, and that's not always an easy thing to do. So that's my answer to that question. Wonderful. Could you please recommend some attorneys who are experts in writing protective ordinances? Um, I don't know. I could tell you this. I'll say, I, I'll, I'll, unless there's some uh, 
Nicole or somebody wants to jump in, because I'm not really crazy about making attorney recommendations. You, I'll, I'll tell you this. People like John Smith, who were featured prominently in the Pulitzer Prize winning book and has been on the front lines of this since it started in Washington County, is somebody that would be, I would highly recommend. Uh, there are others out there as well. Jonathan Kamen, who drafted the South Fayette Township and represented the township in its many battles and wars, uh, certainly is somebody that I would, I think, well of. Uh, and I, I, there are a number of attorneys out there that I would recommend, but I'm not going to do here today. But um, I will tell you this, based on what I read in people's zoning codes, there's some not so good attorneys out there. And setting aside uh, your uh, oil and gas ordinances, just in the, the state of the code itself, or the provisions of codes in other things, uh, you go, wow, who got paid for that? I'd get my money back. So that, that's, and, and that's something that I think, and I, by the way, I sent notice to the uh, Allegheny County Bar, uh, and we sent notice of this webinar to each and every municipal solicitor in Allegheny County that represents a municipality. And I wish they would avail themselves to these uh, discussions. And I wish the bar would get more actively involved uh, because some solicitor may be picked because they're good uh, at uh, you know human human resources stuff or managing your finances more focused in that area and not so much in the zoning and planning side. So if your solicitor is not skilled in that, you might want to talk about that with your, your council members about bringing somebody on to consult. Bell Acres is a, a good example of that where they do have a solicitor, but they did bring in uh, consulting attorneys to help them, and uh, so did uh, Forest Hills and a lot of other people. It's like going to the doctor. You know, there's a personal choice there. Maybe you like their bedside manner or not. And also, are they any good at what they do? And I don't go to a, a, a bone doctor for a heart condition. So same thing in that profession too. You wanna to look for people that are skilled and have a track record of success in, in zoning planning and land use. Anybody else on that? Patty, do you have a thought about that? Yeah, but that's something I think that the Allegheny County Bar needs to start sharpening its pencil on too. Wonderful. And to be clear, uh, Food Water Watch, we actually write ordinance is in-house for communities as well and help them guide them through that process. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the Municipal Ordinance Project exists and we'd be happy to help those who wish to have that guidance through this process. So Doug, for you again, what does it cost for a municipality to help get the help and expert consultation from Food and Water Watch? Oh, I'm glad you asked. It costs nothing. <laughs> That's what we do. And, and thankfully, our foundation partners and individual donors here in Allegheny County area, Western PA, support our work. Um, and we work with municipalities and citizens uh, at free of charge. Uh, I would say that our work is very good. I haven't had any, anybody say that what we put out there is untrue or false or misleading. Uh, we provide educational documents to councils. We hold community meetings uh, for free. And if you have a question about some things in your community, get in touch with us after this and we'll schedule a meeting. We can start off with four or five people in a living room and move on to councils and uh, other folks. And it's always good to engage uh, with everyone that, that's involved. Look at that. There's a dog there. It's a cat. Is that a dog ball? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> your dog's paw. <laughs> yeah, paw. That was that was Locking beautiful. Your, uh, beautiful confidence there. Hey, hey Doug. While we while we were sitting here, I thought of one more thing. You know, so I've, I've been doing a lot of these for a long time, um, and the municipal people seem to always be um, someone from Robinson, someone from Peters, and someone from South Fayette because we were on the front lines of this. So it's really cool to see someone from Plum and someone from Jefferson Barrow, and maybe. You know, two, three years from now, you can retire me and have some new people out here fighting this fight. So it's really good to see. Yeah, and, and believe me, there's people getting running for council over this issue and winning, as as example by Nicole. And that's the other part. If somebody doesn't want to hear what you have to say and they're elected as your representative, you got a problem. Because <laughs> they <laughs> forgot what the job was. <laughs> to get that point. Uh, Anything else? Any time? I think we're running up against our time, right? Yep, we're just about finished. We have one last question. Um, as you said, we don't just help elected officials. We also work with directly with the community members. And organize. organize, organize, organize. How would you suggest we start that process with community members as Food and Water Watch? Give us a call. We'll come to the house. 
Uh, or we'll do a Zoom meeting these days because everybody, uh, it's hard to talk with masks and gloves and stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll get, get in touch with us and we'll be happy to organize a discussion. We're doing that right now in uh, places in the North Hills, uh, small group discussions uh, because we can't go drive around anymore and meet people. Uh, so we do it with Zooms here and we can have those discussions and we're off to the races. That's a, it starts with a conversation. Let's have one. All right, beautiful. Well, we are just about out of time. I just once again want to thank all of our panelists for providing such incredibly invaluable information and for taking a Saturday morning to uh, discuss something like this and share their experiences and a wealth of information. Thank you to all of our attendees who gave us some great questions and also gave us their time as well. If you have any questions at all, like Doug said, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, We'll send around our contact information and our follow-up email. And please make sure to tune in on Monday for the second half of our panel in which we will have uh, John Smith and John Dergbach on our legal panel and having uh, representatives from Environmental Health Project and um, Physicians for Social Responsibility talking about the health effects of fracking. Once again, thank you so all, all so very much for a wonderful morning and discussion. And we look forward to talking to you all later. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I love you.